family. Good morning in Central Time and West Coast Time. Well, what about those on the East Coast, right? So we have to say good afternoon to them. And I want to thank everybody for being online today and being here in person. So we, first off, I want to let you know my name is Stuart Schlossman. I'm president and founder of MS Views and News. And we're partnering today with Advanced Neuroscience Institute here in Franklin, Tennessee, who is sponsoring today's program called Innovation in MS Care. Okay, and we have sent out many of the topics on social media and via our database. So for those that are on here, I'm sure that you're very well aware of the topics that we will be doing. So our first speaker today is Dr. Samuel Hunter. And I just want to give a little um, um, biography of Dr. Hunter. And I know I have glasses here. I should be wearing them, right? So Dr. Hunter cares for over a thousand people with MS actively, many with severe or complicated disease. He performs consulting on drug development and research. He draws a broad background in clinical pharmacology and has ongoing interest in neuroophthalmology, neuroimaging, brain repair, and electrophysiology of demyelinating disease. He aims to float he aims to float all the boats in supporting neurologic education and research and to attract research dollars to the Middle Tennessee region for his patients. Dr. Hunter serves as a principal investigator on many neurological trials for both industry partners, for the NIH, affiliated trials, and for investigator initiated protocols. Dr. Hunter has performed basic laboratory research with stem cells and demyelinating disease, numerous national and international research trials for multiple sclerosis, as well as his own trials on his own designs and continues to be active in clinical trials. He works with several nurse practitioners as part of a care team for complex neurological case management. This could go on and on and on. So let's just welcome Dr. Hunter. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, good morning uh, and welcome. And I'm I'm very pleased to be working with uh, Stuart Schlossman and two of my other colleagues that you'll meet in a little bit. And we're going to do some presentations about uh, innovations in MS care and treatment. It's very hard now to do an MS program without talking about what's coming soon and we, we and what's already here that you may not have heard about or understand our perspective on MS. So the, we'll, we'll get started here and uh, we have a number of questions that have been sent in that we'll come back to at the end. So there's gonna be a presentation from me, from Dr. Cockwood, and then from Dr. Cantor. And then there'll be a question and answer session that Stuart's gonna mediate from the questions that have been sent in online. All right, so NeuroNexus is sponsoring this, and that's the local nonprofit for research and education. Just a reminder, you, if you participate in research, you're helping us to cure MS. And we have clinical trials. Every one of these doctors has clinical trials. People who, who participate in clinical trials are heroes that help us all. And, and so there's a lot of things going on. All the time it's changing. So if you've, if you've been in my clinic, you've heard me uh, make wisecracks about MS, and one of them is that it's all in your head, uh, but it's uh, not your imagination. So with that in mind, we're going to proceed to talking about MS and help you understand a little bit more, you and your family, about this illness. So uh, in my presentation, I'm going to go through how we, how we deal with MS in an MS diagnosis, how things are changing in terms of how we care for MS, some of the newer medications, and the future of how we're looking at doing MS care. So one of the things that I strive to help people understand is how they got into this situation. And it's really important uh, both, if, both for your well-being and for your family's understanding that they understand a few things and what MS isn't related to. And it's really not a genetic disease. The risk, however, is genetic. Um, and, and a lot of that genetic risk is propensity to have low vitamin D levels, which is multiple genes. Uh, these, gene, these genes are good genes. Uh, they, were, they were for surviving, and they're very common genes uh, from in people from Northern Europe. It's mostly not a virus. The, although MS acts like a virus, 
It acts like a virus in animals. These diseases in animals are all due to viruses. They're set off by viruses. We can, we can reliably reproduce that. But in people we know, everybody with MS does have a particular virus, and it's called Epstein-Barr. It is a common virus. Most people have it, but every last person with the MS who's ever been, been seen to have MS has this virus. So we're pretty confident that this virus is a part of the puzzle that results in people getting MS. Uh, once upon a time, uh, people perceived that maybe mercury in their fillings was causing problems. Mercury does not cause your problems. If your teeth are in bad shape, you need to get them dealt with. If your fillings are bad shape, you need to get them dealt with, but you don't have to have your fillings removed to take care of your MS. There's been now for 25 years an urban myth circulating on the internet about aspartame uh, and, and it causing MS. It absolutely does not cause MS. It is not that, not a big deal for most people if you're drinking 10 quarts of soda a day you should stop but it is not going to hurt you very much uh, drink coffee or tea they're good for you uh, fungus does not cause MS as far as we can count you're not being poisoned by fungus in the air or by the mold that is an inevitable part of exposures in life uh, fungus isn't good for you to breathe a whole lot of but it doesn't cause your MS um, some people feel like a particular nutritional problem or, or gluten sensitivity or other, other allergies could be the cause of MS. Certainly bad allergies are going to make any inflammatory problem you have worse and poor nutrition could potentially do that, but these don't by themselves do that. We used to think dogs caused MS, and there was a hypothesis that the, the MS was really distemper, uh, which is a canine virus, and, and, and distemper is very much like MS. And so it wasn't a bad idea, but it just doesn't seem to have borne out. And at one time they thought uh, that you got MS because you had a wild lifestyle. And this also is not true. It has nothing to do with it. But basically, you get MS because of bad luck. Um, now. What does cause MS? The genes are important in terms of producing risk, but anybody can get MS under a certain set of circumstances. But they are good genes. They are not like the Joker. They are like, you know, a bad hand of gin rubby. You could play it in certain circumstances, it would work fine, but in others it doesn't. Uh, they tend to keep the immune system running fast and making lots of cells, these genes, which is very good if you have TB or the plague or parasites, which is what, what basically until 100 years ago was the state of affairs for humankind and people were lucky to live to 30. Uh, now we are very healthy and, and we still have these immune systems that are really running uh, strong. Uh, we know low vitamin D is important. Now, low vitamin D is not rare among people, uh, but low vitamin D increases the risk of getting MS 10 times. And we know it's many of these things that have to do with the likelihood of getting MS also have to do with how severe it is. And so it serves both those roles. We talked about Epstein-Barr. Most people have it. There's no sense in checking yourself for it. You will have outrageously positive tests to it. That's normal. You don't have mono still. It's not chronic mono. It's not the same thing. And uh, mononucleosis is a marker for MS risk, but most people with MS didn't have mono and most people with mono don't get MS. So we have become aware from, from careful studies that obesity, especially in adolescence, is a risk factor for MS. Obesity produces inflammation in your body, it promotes inflammation, and that's probably the mechanism why. The one really exceedingly powerful thing that happens in the environment that, that really increases the risk and the severity of MS is tobacco smoking. It's not nicotine, it's the air pollution. And air pollution also does this. So if you live in a big city uh, that's dirty, uh, it actually can make you sick. Uh, salty food probably has a role. We're not talking about just salt in food. We're talking about salty food. And, uh, you know, high daily salt intakes look like they're associated with more MS activity. But still, your MS is mostly just due to bad luck. All right. So the problem with the bad luck is it doesn't stop once it starts. Most of the problems that are going on, you really don't notice. They're building up over time in ways that you can't perceive. And, and the same things that we talked about are also make it worse. 
Um, what kind of symptoms do people get? The symptoms they get are both invisible and visible. This, the invisible symptoms, for the most part, don't indicate the severity, but they are annoying to folks with MS because they can't get other people to understand that they don't feel good. And uh, the, the number one is fatigue. I interviewed a gentleman yesterday for a series associated with this, and he can barely walk. And, and he has trouble with his vision and he had to quit work. And he blames the fatigue for the worst parts of, of life. And, and a lot of what people with MS say has to do with this. We'll talk a little more about fatigue. Uh, sensation abnormalities, which can include pain. Uh, mood abnormalities, uh, which have to do with uh, depressive-like symptoms for the most part in MS, are a huge part of why people don't function well. Uh, dizziness, vertigo, the sensation of movement is very common in MS and it's due to very small disruptions in the brain for the most part, but they're very disturbing and, and cause a lot of illness. There are a few invisible symptoms which really do indicate the severity. Uh, these are thinking and word finding problems because uh, to, to the people who have MS, these are, they, they're showing a lot of effort to get things done. This is frustrating them. It's the same thing as trying to function late in the day if you haven't had enough sleep, if you're drugged or you've been sick. Bladder dysfunction, of course, um, unless somebody has really gross problems with their bladder or bowels, uh, is, is not noticeable, but it does indicate the severity of the disease. So what, what we can see easily are things like vision and balance, strength or clumsiness, things that affect how people walk, tremors. Um, tremors, again, are, are really only really important if they're bad enough to interfere with how people's hands work, but they're noticeable many times. Other kinds of coordination problems and actually problems with speech. And we distinguish in neurology between speech and language. And language and word finding is a completely separate issue than how people produce sounds, which is, you know, technically slurred speech. All right, so you have people who have lots of different problems, but they all have the same illness. It may be different from person to person, what combination, but fatigue is a huge problem uh, for people with MS. Trouble with their concentration and their vision are, are often very frustrating problems. These probably are among the most common reasons that people have occupational disability with MS. But some people will get coordination problems, some people have walking problems. These are often signs that the MS is affecting their nervous system in a more severe way. Um, pain is a very dramatic symptom, but it actually doesn't represent as serious a dysfunction in the nervous system. And uh, spasms are painful as well and can be correlated with really serious problems. And then of course, people have trouble with their bladder. Um, that is actually something that there is so much to do for now and, and a completely different area of specialty care than what neurology usually is. Now, the underlying reason why people get, it, get MS is they have aggressive immune cells called lymphocytes that cause MS. We share our immune system with animals going back to sharks. And, and the immune system is a very basic function. And, and we have immune elements that are trained genetically, and we have others that are trained by experience. And T and B cell lymphocytes are trained by experience. And these cells are what go awry. They get trained to react to the wrong thing and then they don't forget. And these aggressive lymphocytes, in this image on the left, that is not a heart, that is a lymph node. It has inputs and outputs. And cells come into it from experiencing things in the skin and from the blood, and then they react with other immune cells and they get activated and they head out to get back into the bloodstream. And once they do, they, they travel around the body looking for areas to cause inflammation that they re react with. They go in there, they sense, if they see what they're reacting with, they're going to attack it. And they literally go in and they start dropping grenade-like chemicals onto whatever the cells are that they react with. And this, of course, is very disruptive. It disrupts the connections in the brain. In the last panel there, you see the one nerve cell you have that your mother talked about you getting on. And it has an input and it has an output. And it's got connections in between. These 
these connections are, are, are fabulously long in most cases, sometimes thousands or, or, or a million times as long as the width of the cell. Very delicate with insulation that lets them function with very modest energy requirements for their size. This is what's damaged in MS. Uh, the, if it's damaged really severely, then, then it leads to actually the loss of the nerve cell as well. And these, this kind of damage is in part repairable and in part not repairable. So this is, this is the, the wanted poster for the guys who are involved in causing this damage. Lymphocytes are the ones that for the most part are causing the problem. They are the instigators. You can actually take lymphocytes from one, uh, one organism, give them to another organism, and cause the disease. We know it's completely sufficient to do so. That's why we call it an immune disease or an autoimmune disease, because you can reproduce it that way. Now, there are other things that started it, but we, we know that those cells are sufficient. And then they have friends. They have B cell friends. The B cells kind of get involved along the way. They're just part of the hangers on. The T cells direct it. The T cells assassinate things, but the B cells kind of keep the party going. Um, some kinds of B cells make antibodies. In certain people, antibodies are very important in the MS process. Those are called plasma cells have nothing to do with plasma. <laughs> so uh, they're just called that. And the T cells really are the hooligan slash ninja killers in the nervous system. They get in there and just a very few of them are responsible for the majority of the damage that occurs. Uh, the macrophages or uh, are genetically programmed cells that clean up the mess and they get in there and they can get very excited and they can cause injury themselves. So uh, this is a very complex slide that basically talks to you about what we mean by demyelination. Uh, the inflammation in the, in, the, in the white matter of the nervous system causes disruption in the insulation, which leads to a very unreliable energy state and ability to transmit signals. Everything we do, every last movement, Every word involves this huge orchestra of these movements in, in very short time frames to make what we do as organisms really happen. And, and that is what goes wrong. And so signal block of these signals leads to more uh, in, inappropriate consequences than just it slowing down. It's slowing down, you don't notice. If the if signal gets there, you don't notice. It's just less reliable and it blocks and then it doesn't work. All right, when we boil down to the tiniest levels, and this is, we're talking about a, a thousandth of a millimeter in size, these axons are there. They have this self-contained energy state where they pump, uh, pump uh, ions around to control the signals and they're vulnerable to their environment. Certain other signals can really stress them and overload them and lead to actually loss of the nerve cell once they're demyelinated. They're extremely vulnerable. It's kind of like a frayed wire and, and if you keep bending it, it will break. All right. So the epitome uh, of, of real discovery that it happened in, in the 1980s when we realized that MS was not a disease of attacks. MS is a disease of constant inflammation in the brain. And this is a loop over a year of an MRI in an untreated MS patient. This was actually done before people had treatment. Showing these areas of inflammation blossoming, I always compare it to acne to my patients. It comes and goes, many of the scars heal up, they leave little marks, or some of the severe ones will leave more obvious marks over time. And it's this damage that's 95% of what really happens in MS. In the part of the brain, in this part of the brain, where you don't notice anything really happening. It, you notice the input and output pathways. We're gonna to go to the next slide. Now this slide is showing over many, many years, over seven years, what the consequences of that inflammation. And what you see is the brain shrinking, the, the spaces on the outside of the brain getting bigger, the space on the inside of the brain getting bitter. This is brain evaporating from the damage of inflammation. 
this is what's stopped by treatment. And, and if you, if you uh, refuse treatment for MS, you will, in most cases, experience this kind of damage. And this is completely irreversible. You cannot, you cannot recover this kind of damage in the brain. Many people with MS have this kind of serious uh, loss function even before we get an MS diagnosis. So let's talk a little bit about how things have changed. So 30 years into this, I'm 30 years into my career with MS, um, the old ways of looking at this was neurologists used to t try to tell people MS isn't such a bad disease, that it's usually benign, that treatment was really optional, that we should just keep it, keep life simple and avoid risks, and you should just live with your MS problems. But we've learned that that isn't necessary you know, we know MS takes away quality of life and sometimes years. There's a 50% difference in terms of death and serious disability in people who are treated quickly and people who aren't treated. Um, we've got enormous amounts of data that treating MS at the first symptom and to continue to treat it is important. Um, the goal is to prevent disability and impairment. And we know that MS is not benign 95% of the time. Uh, it, it, the, as far as taking risks, we, everyone feels you should take risks appropriate to the severity of the disease and you should try to manage the symptoms. So we have drugs now that work on many parts of the nervous system and this is an example of one class of drugs that are called S1P modulators. There's about to be four of these on the market just like there used to be interferon beta. Many of our drugs do multiple things. And this is just a slide illustrating what they do to the brain cells. And literally, they, they affect every one of the brain cells in a favorable direction. Not only that, they keep the inflammation out of the brain. So this is, this is a class of drugs that controls MS. It doesn't fix MS. But controlling it in the long term means people feel normal. Uh, what we know is this class of medicines, and this is an example where small rodents were harmed in the production of these pictures, because this is an experimental kind of MS we call EAE. And uh, what this is looking at is the tiniest uh, microscopic levels, and these little things that look like scrumpy Christmas trees are, are the input systems from nerve cells in the gray matter of the brain, which is not what we think of traditionally as being affected by MS. What this gray matter is, is where all all the connections between nerve cells are and these little tiny bumps are called dendritic spines and the dendritic spines normally connect all the different nerve cells together when you get inflammation in the brain even remote from these areas and usually remote all of a sudden the immune cells that are resident in the brain activate and they eat these connections. They, they, they normally maintain them, but when they see inflammation, they start taking things apart. This happens just the same as in a concussion and in Alzheimer's disease, people lose these connections. In the middle uh, picture, you can see how these are down about 50% in that area. But if these animals are treated, with, with medicines that suppress that inflammatory response in the nervous system, you see a near normal amount of these connections. This is why treatment is so important. Even treatments that don't reverse the, the underlying immune defects are important because they can control the, the dysfunction in the nervous system that people complain most about. All right, so we've got all these things that are stressing out axons, both acutely when they're inflamed and chronically because the, they, they aren't able to be repaired well and they have an energy state that's really not different from poor blood flow. It's not poor blood flow, it's due to inflammation. We've got new approaches to MS. We try to monitor people to identify who is having trouble with their walking, with their limbs, with their cognition, and their vision. You'll hear an additional talk about vision today. And uh, then we can control spasticity. And the most successful recent advance has been higher dose of toxin injections, which are like Botox, but it's a different product, that are enough to control large, uh, large muscles 
which we never were able to control before and, and tailor it to allow people to have their legs unbound and be able to move now. So you can measure yourself. There's ways to do this online. There are online functions. Your doctor can do this in the office. Uh, there are different systems. Speed and processing are the things. Memory efficiency is also affected with MS. But one of the simple things to do is measure how far you can walk. And we recommend you use the 500 meter walk and you measure how long that takes. And we also measure the speed on a short walk, which is a 25 foot timed walk. Everybody has a stopwatch on their phone and can do this. Um, there's a way to measure your hands with a nine-hole peg test. Um, I have a colleague who's, uh, who's promoted patients doing this themselves and has videos on YouTube on how to do it. Uh, you can also keep, keep track of your tremor just by videotaping it. That's an easy way to do it. I also have people draw spirals uh, to, to keep track of their tremor. Um, there's a, a, a series of diagrams called the patient derived disability steps where you can put yourself on a nine point scale as to how bad your MS is and then you can figure out where you fall on the the bell curve of MS so we have we, we look at all these functions like cognition there's a decoding task that we do in the office called SDMT we have one called uh, low contrast visual acuity we have the nine hole peg test which which is j just a time dexterity test, and we have ambulation. And all these tests have proved useful in research, but they're also being used to follow people over time. So, so everybody with MS can put their self on this scale. Uh, th this is, you can just read the description. You can say, am I zero, a one, a two, a three, a four, or so forth. The higher disability people, the people who are barely walking or have to use gate aids are there. This is just a way to look. And we use legs in MS because they're the most affected generally by uh, disability. And the reason is this longest pathway gets beat up on the most by the inflammation. So we have a way to convert the number of years of disease people have to how bad they are on the scale. You know, people who are having walking problems early are, are much more severe than people who never have any. Um, and so these are the different scales. And, and this, this is a great way to quickly sort of get the picture. Um, because some people develop walking problems over 30 years and some people develop them over three years. So those are completely different severities of MS. All right. So there's also some new medications and some new twists on some old medications you need to be aware of. And, and despite uh, our love-hate relationship with the pharma, uh, pharma, uh, pharma industry, the drug companies have been at hard at work because this is what they do. They find new medicines. Some of these medicines will be clearly improved over old medicines. And some new ways are discovered to, to look at, at older medicines and how they're working. One of the old medicines that we have for MS that's kind of new to the United States, but it's actually a medicine for which there were Nobel Prize given in the 1980s, is actually uh, the most effective and cost-effective medicine. And brain repair has been observed in 40% of the people who get this. And it's much more improvement than on any of our other medications. The treatment is complicated. It cleans out the immune system. It restores it with stem cells. It's manageable, but thyroid problems with it are not rare and there are rare serious problems with blood or kidney disorders. And it's become clear recently that you shouldn't get chiropractic around the time of the treatment that increases the risk of having a stroke, which is due to the chiropractic actually. Um, and it also is important to control your blood pressure because there's bleeding risks from that, including a stroke. Uh, we've also learned that, that during the time when the immune system's weak, it's also important to avoid uncooked milk, meat, or seafood, or poorly handled food. Now, this was always an issue. Uh, this was always an issue with people with MS because they, they get very sick when they have an infection. But these infections are uh, much more serious than people who have temporarily weakened immune systems from some of our medications. So this is very old data, but this is showing Lemtrada was more effective than, than Rebif, uh, a, a very standard first treatment. 
uh, EMS medicine. And this is a good group of uh, patients responding to rebif in this upper black line. This is the, our disability scale. These are people with fairly mild disability who are treated. But the people who got Lemtrada, which is a much more aggressive treatment, do two to three times as well. They actually improve in disability better, more of them improve, and they stay stable. So we uh, at Advanced Neurosciences, in collaboration with uh, Dr. Kanner, who you'll hear later, have done some studies uh, in people with long-term limb trauma treatment. And, and long-term limb trauma treatment, it, we're mapping it out here on scales. And up in the upper left corner, you see the studies that were done to get the drug approved, which are done in people on lower disability. And they largely stay stable or improve a little bit over time. When we treated sicker people, people who are not walking well, these are in the, the lower right side, the red stars and the blue stars in the middle of the picture. Uh, what we see over many years is these people continue to improve in disability. Not only do they not get worse, the average person gets better. Now some of the people get worse, 15 or 20 percent are getting worse, but that means the average here getting so much better means that some people get absolutely dramatic improvements. And, and this is a, a disability that traditionally is considered something that many doctors won't even treat because they think it's futile to treat. And this has become clear that people should get treatment. The least of the benefits is people are going to usually stay stable and the vast majority of people will be stable or improved. All right. I have gone to calling this secondary regressive MS. Everybody's heard about progressive MS. These are people who have progressive MS who actually get better. So I call them regressive MS. And, and this is just something that you never saw in earlier eras. And now with highly effective treatment, we're able to get this in a significant fraction of people. All right, there's some other really exciting new medicines that are actually, in some cases, even old medicines. And cladribine or mavenclad is an oral version of a very old medicine for modifying the disease. This is a medicine that I've been acquainted with for all of my career. And it is a way to modify the disease in the long term. It is a pill now, a very small dose of a chemotherapy medicine. It's a very elegantly designed chemotherapy medicine. It has very little effects on other tissues in the body other than the immune system. And it's a weight-based treatment. It's uh, very effective. It's just four or five day treatments over 14 months. And this is just pills. You swallow the pill and one or two pills a day, depending on your weight. And it's a total of 20 days of treatment that you get over 14 months for five years. It does not cause major side effects. Uh, some people will get low blood counts, a rash or nausea. These are temporary problems. Uh, shingles is a small risk. 75% of patients who take this medicine will not have a relapse for five years. It is, it is phenomenal. Now, it's a new medicine. It does have a cancer warning. The cancer risk is actually quite low. It's about one in 300 which is a fifth of the risk of Jelenia and a tenth of the risk of Tecfidera, which don't have cancer warnings on them. So, so our government is unfortunately not very consistent with how they apply these warnings, but they, uh, it's, they just want people to be informed. It is labeled for pregnancy risks. You need to use contraception for six months after you take Take a, uh, take a course of treatment, and the reason for that is is because it would undoubtedly cause trouble with a pregnancy if it was given during a pregnancy. And, and if someone does conceive between the first and second parts of the treatment, they can delay the pregnancy. They can delay the second year of treatment till after they're done. It, it actually, uh, you can actually breastfeed while taking the medicine as long as you throw the milk away for 10 days after. All right, so there are other medicines that are related to the Fingolimod or Gelinia we talked about earlier, a second generation S1P modulator. They don't repair the problem, they control it. Uh, Gelinia was the first drug. It's now been approved for children. Uh, there are newly identified risks that are infrequent of rare serious infections. There's newly identified risk of seizures, about 2% in adults and about 10% in children. 
about 10% of MS patients have seizures at some point in, in their life anyway, but this is exactly what's important for people to understand. There is a risk with these medicines of severe reactivation of the MS when people stop it. So it's very important to plan any change or, or dropping your therapy with this. There's a drug that was just approved called Mazent or Saponamod that has proven benefit in people with established progressive MS. And it has some complicated metabolism issues and medication interactions. It also was demonstrated to have benefits on mental processing speed. The first such MS medicine where this data is really dramatic and convincing. There are two more medicines on the way in this family. One's called Ozanamod that'll likely be here early next year. It's, it's a lot like Jelenia, but won't need a first dose. There's another one named Panesimod, which uh, beat a Baggio in a study, actually, and it doesn't have any metabolism issues. One of the interesting things is dealing with the class of drugs that, that Tecfidera belongs to. Tecfidera is called a methyl fumarate. Its problem has always been GI side effects are, are make it difficult. It's a twice a day medicine, but there is a new third generation methyl fumarate. Tecfidera is actually a second generation. The original one was called Fumiderm. It's approved for psoriasis in Europe. The second generation was Tecfidera. And the trouble with nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, belly pain, and flushing are legendary for some people, just can't take it. Uh, Tecfidera has a very small risk of PML and other rare infections. It appears to slowly cull the lymphocyte population that's causing the trouble in MS. The third generation drug, which will likely be available early next year, is called Vumiderm or deroximal fumarate, it has virtually no GI distress if taken with food. It's minor flushing issues, none if it's taken with the meal. There's another drug called monomethyl fumarate in testing. So what about spasticity? Botulinum toxin has been available for many years. The doses were low. Dysport, which is the newer branded product that is higher dose, can address many major muscles. I can treat several limbs at once even that are in bad spasticity. I can improve severe leg spasticity and make walking better. In many cases, we're avoiding baclofen pumps uh, because with baclofen pumps, the problem is people often can't walk after they get them. There are new drugs drugs coming that control spasticity better. There's a drug called Arbaclofen ER that we hope will be improved and on the market uh, within the year that gives longer action, more benefit, and less side effects. All right. So where are we going with MS? We want to uh, enhance brain repair. We want to improve walking. Um, the prior drug that enhanced walking was called Dalfampridine ER. There's a drug that we have tested uh, that's been published that, that beats the pants off Dalfampridine. And it's in a third uh, stage trial, what we call phase three trial, where it's an old medicine, but a new application. It's a mantidine, but it's much higher dose than what you may have received before for fatigue and it's released in a very gradual way. The FDA approval could be of even early uh, in 2021. It's already on the market as a medicine called GoCovery for Parkinson's. You need to have normal kidney function. There's a low risk of confusion with it. So we know repair happens. This is a slice of a brain that's showing repair. These big white zones in the middle of the brain are areas that are not repaired, but you see fainter areas that we call shadow plaques and you see plaques that are partially repaired. We know this goes on. Uh, we know smaller lesions repair better. We know things that are inflamed for a long time don't repair well. These are called black holes and repair stalls in many of the lesions. It's highly dependent on age. So the targets to repair are these cells that are in the stem cell family called oligonitrocyte progenitors or precursors. And we know that these cells are present in the lesions and they are not able to repair the lesion. But under certain circumstances, this repair can be covered. Uh, there's, this is one of the strategies for improving things. First of all, stopping inflammation like we do with Lemtrada or other powerful medicines can, can do this. The energy status improves, it keeps lesions small, repairs more likely, and we can improve the function of demyelinated axons uh, by improving the health of the axon. There are, there, are experiment, there are experimental treatments in development. There's one that may come to market within a couple years that's a very megadose of 
of a vitamin called biotin uh, that's under, under study to see if it can improve brain function in people who have large amounts of disability. Uh, these kinds of repairs are the best way if you can get myelin to repair. If you get myelin to repair, it takes care of a host of problems in the nervous system, and there are experimental trials going on. Several things have been tried. The results so far are not impressive, but it's clear in animals we can make this happen. And, and even 30 years ago in experiments I worked with, we could make animals go from paralyzed to standing up and waving at you. It was very impressive. Well, I'm gonna wind up there and let Stuart introduce the next talk. Thank you very Thank much. You. So next, we're going to have Dr. Jonathan Cockwood, and Dr. Cockwood is going to be speaking about visual issues with multiple sclerosis. I want to read to you a little bit about him. Dr. Cockwood is a neurologist and neuro-ophthalmologist specializing in multiple sclerosis. In 2006, Dr. Cockwood joined Randall T. Shapiro at the Shapiro Center for Multiple Sclerosis in Minneapolis, Minnesota. He became the medical and executive director at the Shapiro Center in 2008. He currently serves as the medical director of the Center for Neurological Visual Disorders, Vision Disorders, and the Neurovisual Diagnostics Laboratory at the Minneapolis Clinic of Neurology. These people always want to trip me up in their long words, all right? But Dr. Cockwood is actively involved in clinical research as a principal investigator in multiple sclerosis, clinical trials, and has published research on multiple sclerosis and neuroophthalmology. Let's welcome Dr. Cockwood. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you. Great introduction. You did very well with the not tripping up. Well, great. Um, so I'm happy to be able to talk to all of you about uh, vision disorders in MS, a subject I'm passionate about. Um, uh, and uh, understanding that, too, we need to keep uh, a little levity. Uh, Dr. Shapiro was uh, famous uh, at a time when perhaps we didn't have uh, effective treatments for MS or sometimes no treatments for MS when he first started treating patients. and. He would often tell his patients, um, well, we can laugh or we can cry, so let's choose to laugh. Um, so yeah, it takes a minute, right? So <laughs> um, some of you may remember probably five, six years ago, there were a couple of, these, these actually weren't my pilots on the flight down here, but um, five, six years ago, there was a flight, um, it was a Northwest Airlines flight, in fact, where two pilots overflew the Minneapolis airport all the way into Wisconsin. Apparently they were busy. They said they were busy on their laptops in the cockpit and just didn't notice. So I suspect it might be these guys. I don't know. But anyway, so, um, but uh, on a more serious but also somewhat humorous note, we talk about brain function and we talk about seeing. And I think many people uh, feel that vision, that we see things with our eyes. In fact, that's not the case at all. Our eyes simply collect the data that then our brains process. Now here's a humorous uh, um, a cartoon uh, that uh, attempts to show the uh, differences between men and women. Uh, I'm hoping I'm not going to get hashtagged for this, but uh, essentially, uh, yes, we do have different perspectives as well, but it's our brain and the interpretation of the visual information that our eyes collect that is really um, uh, how we see, really what vision is, and then the processing of that vision. Of course, the brain is, is integrally involved in processing that visual information that you collect. And the optic nerve uh, actually is an extension of the brain into the eye. So the optic nerve uh, extends from the brain into the eye, and even the layers of the retina, as I'll show you on some, uh, um, on some slides later, the layers of the retina have different functions, and many of those layers of the retina are nervous tissue. The nerves in your eye are part of your brain. It is a projection of the central nervous system, and it's one of the few places we can directly measure um, the, the uh, impact of MS on the brain. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you some uh, data and some information later about that. So in general, what is multiple sclerosis? So I think multi there's a lot of confusion about this, but it's clear, I think, that, um, that uh, MS is 
an autoimmune disease, or at least the immune system is integrally involved in, in the production of the damage and the injury that occurs. So the immune system is clearly involved. Uh, immune cells that don't belong there invade the brain, the spinal cord, and, and in fact, immune cells uh, kind of set up shop in the brain, and they may sit there and just continually pick away at the brain. Um, generally, the brain does not have uh, uh, immune system activity unless there's a reason, like an infection. When there is an autoimmune disease, like multiple sclerosis, the immune cells, for reasons we don't understand fully, are called into the brain where they cause damage and scars, also known as sclerosis, um, and that can occur in many different locations. The brain is certainly involved, the optic nerve, and the spinal cord is primarily considered the central nervous system. Um, I think I would leave this one to Dr. Uh, Hunter to explain. Uh, we were discussing this, and, and he, uh, 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 th this isn't supposed to be on the humor slide, but um, there actually are some similarities. Uh, you could perhaps think of, of acne uh, or MS as acne of the brain. There certainly are some similarities, um, but in, in general, I guess one difference is uh, nobody can see your uh, uh, lesions and plaques like they can see your acne. <laughs> And steroids, by the way, uh, any, anyone who's ever been treated with steroids, and even if you don't have acne, you will get it if you have steroids. Uh, so almost any, uh, almost any symptom, neurological symptom of MS, uh, including some vague symptoms like fatigue, which is really hard to nail down. It can be a muscular fatigue. Um, it can be an overwhelming uh, lassitude um, where you just don't have any energy to do anything, even though you may not feel weak or may be able to do something. You just don't have the energy or even the desire to do it. So principally, there are the connections within the brain are damaged, and the interconnected areas of the brain become damaged. And that becomes very, very important, both in the visual system and in terms of how the brain functions and the issues, symptoms, uh, and problems that people with MS develop. I'm going to go over a little bit of the anatomy, so when we get to some of the more um, uh, technical uh, data I'm going to show you in, in imaging uh, of the uh, back of the eye and nerves in the eye, we can ha have the same uh, kind of terminology here. So uh, in the panel on the right, you see a schematic uh, where the optic nerve is in the background, and there's a slice through the optic nerve just to give you uh, to see essentially where that is. On, on the uh, a diagram of the uh, cut eyeball, you see the optic nerve in the back. Two important structures that are really important to MS is the optic nerve and the macula. And it turns out that there are nerve fibers in the back of the eye that emanate from that optic nerve and spread out in a very predictable pattern. Here's a diagram of these retinal nerve fibers where the circle in the, in, in the center of the crosshairs is the macula, and then the larger circle is the, the place the placeholder of your optic nerve. There are no nerve fibers on the optic nerve itself. The fibers and the pattern you see coming out of that central disc are the individual nerve fibers. Now these nerve fibers are coming from all over the retina. The cell body of the nerve sits in the retina and then the axon of the nerve, the wire if you will, then continues on through the retina into the optic nerve and then the optic nerve carries that information off to the brain where that brain, uh, uh, where your brain, as we said before, you see with your brain through visual processing. So one thing I would like to point out to you is there's a bundle of fibers that you can see directly between the two small circles. It makes a little sort of loop and you see all the other fibers looping around it. That is called the papilla macular bundle. For reasons that aren't entirely clear, multiple sclerosis preferentially damages this layer of nerve cells in your eye. We can use that both for diagnostic purposes to help diagnose someone with MS, and as I'll show you some further data, we can use visual measures, including the thickness of that nerve fiber layer, uh, to determine even perhaps how well your MS treatment may be, may be working for you. So, um, so keep this in mind as we, as we go through. Now, if we, if we um, take a little closer look here, and uh, now this is centered, the, the red box is uh, showing you this section of the, uh, the slice essentially through the back of the eye. And the image you see below, the colored image there, is actually a image from a, uh, a something called optical coherence tomography. Optical coherence tomography, we'll just call it OCT from now on. Um, so OCT is able to measure uh, in great detail these various layers of your retina. 
If you see on uh, the black and white diagram on the right, it shows you what these layers are and, and, uh, and, and the initials uh, refer to different layers of the retina. The very top of the diagram is a layer on uh, the black and white diagram on the right shows some small nerve cell bodies and then these nerve cell bodies are then contributing their axon to that layer uh, that sits on the inside eye. Now, in the color diagram below here, what we see is the, the uh, gray, uh, as opposed to the colored area, is actually the back of the eye, and the gray is inside of the eye. So it's a, a little perplexing. Um, however, the nerve fiber layer sits on top of the retina. Well, if you have nerves on top of the retina, how does the light penetrate through the retina to get all the way to the photoreceptors that you see at the very bottom of the diagram? Those large cells, photoreceptors, are actually the cells that receive light information and are really the first step in some of the processing. Now, all of these layers of nerve cells in your retina are interconnected. There are other nerves interconnecting between different layers, but primarily we'll focus on two issues. The nerve cell bodies that exist in the macula are very important, uh, and I'll show you some data on this uh, shortly. And then the retinal nerve fiber layer, which is that very top striated layer you see on, on that diagram. So the question I asked related to how, do you, how are you able to see if there are nerves on top of your retina, well, it turns out that those nerves are not myelinated. Nerve cells are completely clear, and the light passes through them. Um, the nerve cells don't begin to myelinate until, uh, until they uh, form the optic nerve. So myelination or demyelination, such as optic neuritis, doesn't occur actually in the retina. Demyelination can occur in the optic nerve and, of course, elsewhere in the brain. In general, I think if you have MS, um, uh, we have to distinguish uh, uh, visual issues due to MS and visual issues for other reasons. Um, and I I'm commonly uh, have to remind myself and remind others that people, uh, other physicians, I think, that people with MS are just people. They get the same diseases and the same things that normal people get. And sometimes doctors, we doctors kind of have a, our blinders on and we start thinking that everything that happens to you is related to your multiple sclerosis. And that may not be true. So it's important in general to have good regular eye health. So good vision health means regular eye, ex eye examinations. Uh, those eye exam exams are screening for things like glaucoma, uh, for cataracts. Uh, dry eye and cataracts are very common in people with MS. Dry eye can occur because of some of the drugs that we use to treat, such as bladder. Uh, uh, bladder symptoms occur, or, I'm sorry, bladder medications uh, uh, commonly worsen or cause dry eye. Uh, we also uh, see cataracts more commonly in, in MS. Um, and this is in part due to, well, people with MS are just people, right? You get cataracts, but when we use steroids, steroids are a very useful and important treatment when we're treating a relapse, but uh, they do have consequences, and one of those consequences is accelerating the development of cataracts. So in patients who have been treated with steroids repeatedly, they are much more likely to get cataracts, and there are certain types of cataracts that are much more common if you've been treated with steroids. So if you have MS, it's even more important that you get your eye examinations done on a very regular basis, uh, typically uh, every two years for a young person for refractive uh, uh, glasses checks. Uh, there is also screening for other, uh, other uh, issues such as ocular melanoma. Uh, and, and in addition to the glaucoma we mentioned. The MS-related issues, uh, uh, we can see uh, ocular misalignments that can produce degrees of double vision. We can see painful eye conditions. Uh, we can see uh, 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 disorders of tracking, disorders of what we call saccades, or making a rapid volitional eye movement from one target to another, for instance. Um, and, and then, in addition to the various issues that occur in the uh, optic nerve itself, and then there are some visual symptoms that result that are very, very uh, um, nebulous sometimes, like uh, contrast sensitivity problems, and I'll endeavor to explain that here in a minute. So here's an example of some MRIs, and we see, of course, uh, on, on these MRI images that 
Um, while there are lesions apparent in the brain and the brain tissue, these scars in these locations don't really impact people's vision directly, although they might impact uh, the visual processing. When you undercut these visual interconnections that the brain uses to process, it can slow down processing. Just as we see in the cognitive dysfunction that occurs in persons with MS, we can see a, 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 an issue with visual processing in, in, uh, that parallels cognitive dysfunction or sometimes is separate and distinct from it. So while these may not directly cause vision problems, they can indirectly. And of course, lesions in the brainstem can impact the ability to control eye movements, um, uh, can cause nystagmus, uh, ocular misalignments, uh, double vision, and various other issues. So here's another image of a slice through the brain. Now this is a coronal image sliced in this plane. So uh, you see uh, in the lower portion, the center portion, two round circles, and inside of that circle is a little, should be a little dot, at least on the right side of this image, which is actually this individual's left optic nerve, is, is bright. The dot in the center, you see a bright dot in the center, and that is optic nerve enhancement. Uh, this is an indication of acute optic neuritis. There's inflammation in that optic nerve, which is why the dye that's injected into the vein then leaks into the optic nerve when we do the MRI. And you need to do the MRI by appropriate techniques that are designed to enhance the ability to detect this subtle, uh, what can be sometimes very subtle inflammation. So it's important then that uh, to image the visual system, but imaging the visual system isn't terribly sensitive with MRI scan. There are other ways to do this. There's uh, the, uh, at the arrow you can then see the uh, contrast enhancement, and again the optic nerve on the opposite side is not enhancing. Here's um, an example of a lesion in the brain stem. Lesions in the brain stem can impact um, uh, uh, ocular motility, uh, uh, smooth pursuit, tracking, nystagmus, uh, stability of gaze, stability of, of vision. Um, so that would be an example of, an, of a, a uh, MS lesion that could directly impact uh, visual function. So as an example, if you have uh, uh, at these, these uh, two um, examples using essentially electricity to light the light bulb and how, what is the pathway? As I alluded to before, uh, these lesions disrupt the interconnections in the brain and they can interfere with processing and primarily this shows up with speed of processing. So in this schematic on the left you see a few lesions uh, but the pathway is pretty much unscathed, goes all the way through so the electricity gets through to light up the light bulb. Uh, the image on the right, however, where you see something that looks more like Swiss cheese, where uh, there's been a lot of disruption to, to these uh, uh, fiber tracks in the brain. And, and then you see this uh, kind of circuitous uh, work around, and then the bulb gets lit, but it's kind of dim. So um, that, I think, is a good analogy to think of in terms of what happens over time as you accumulate more and more lesions, and whether it's visual processing, whether it's cognitive processing, whether it's some other um, uh, uh, neurological function, uh, cognitive or spinal cord uh, uh, mobility, uh, sensory uh, bladder issues, the same principle applies throughout the central nervous system. These lesions again disrupt and then they produce symptoms. So if you have damage in your optic nerve, this is an attempt to say on the, t on the, on the, uh, the top schematic, is that the new Corvette? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I need to get my eyes checked, but uh, I saw a picture of that one recently, and they look very nice. But the red color here is what you want to look at. So on the left side, we have a very saturated image. The red is very bright and intense, and as the patient looks through their left eye, that's the image they see. Uh, it's clear and crisp. And when you look, and then the patient looks through the optic neuritis eye through the right eye, and you see essentially that it's not quite as clear, although you see pretty well, but the color is washed out and dim. So very important, now this could be acute optic neuritis, uh, when, when the vision is maximally impacted um, and optic neuritis evolves kind of slowly uh, over a few days to a few weeks, uh, and then you get this recovery. So over time, uh, uh, this person's visual dysfunction may in fact recover, but the, most, the two most common residual visual problems that somebody has after they've had essentially complete recovery uh, from their optic neuritis um, is color desaturation, so reds and greens especially aren't quite as bright, uh, and 
an issue called contrast. Uh, I will show you something in a minute to try to give you a sense of what contrast vision problems uh, 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 can appear like. But in uh, in day-to-day -day life, essentially, contrast problems show up when there is flat or gray lighting conditions. I live in Minnesota, and in fact, it's snowing there now, and our first snow of the year in October. And when you when when you are in the snow, uh, and skiers, of course, can can relate to this. Um, these subtle contours are really difficult when the light is flat. So a skier may use uh, tinted glasses or tinted lenses to improve their contrast, and in fact, you can do that for MS as well. And I'll show you again a few examples of some contrast impairment. The panel below shows double vision or attempts to show double vision. Now there's one very, very important thing to understand. If you ever have double vision, regardless of the cause, double vision is a very common symptom. So if you don't have MS and you have double vision, don't necessarily run out and think that you have MS, and, uh, um, but there's a few observations you need to make. It's very, very important to understand when you have double vision, um, your doctor needs to understand uh, a few, and if you make a few careful observations, it will help your doctor understand what's going on. So if you ever develop double vision, the most important thing to understand is that neurological double vision, the types of double vision we'd see from MS, occur when your eyes don't line up. When one eye is looking over here and another eye is looking over there, they see two different images and your brain doesn't know what to do with that. So if you have neurological double vision and one eye's looking here and one eye's looking there, if you close one eye, double vision goes away. Close the other eye, double vision goes away. If you have double vision just in one eye, in other words, if you close one eye and you still see double, and then you close the other and the double goes away, the problem's just in one eye. And that is not MS related. So you, but you, and your doctor can definitely benefit from that observation, especially if the double vision isn't present when you go in to see your physician. So when you go see your doctor, you may get something called a refraction. This is a way to check to make sure that it's not something simple like you just need glasses. Um, and as you see the image on the right, the foropter uh, is, is the, uh, the tool that uh, measures, and uh, I'm, I'm sure many of you could repeat verbatim, which is better, one or two one or two. You've probably heard this quite a bit if you've gone to the eye doctor and that, that is a very, very old tool and we're still using it. There are uh, electronic versions of auto refractors, uh, uh, but that's still probably the most widespread uh, tool in use in the eye doctor's office. Astigmatism is another thing that can be corrected with glasses and is not due to MS. It's easy to determine if you have astigmatism simply by the foropter and the what we call refraction um, that you've seen uh, previously on the previous slide. But uh, blurred vision can be interpreted as double vision. And you can actually can have blurred vision in both eyes that looks like double vision so that when you cover one eye, the double vision doesn't go away, but it gets a lot better. Then you cover the other eye, the double vision doesn't go away. But with the two eyes working together, the double vision is worse, meaning that you have double vision in both eyes. So that's possible, still, uh, that can be easily determined. Now what about the op optic neuritis? So this is another example of optic neuritis. The arrows point at some uh, contrast enhancement. I mentioned the vision declines over several days and will begin to recover within a couple of weeks. If we do nothing about it, uh, uh, initial events of optic neuritis generally recover pretty well, at least in most people. Sometimes there's a prolonged recovery or we may have profound vision loss from the first event or bilateral vision loss which might indicate actually an, another demyelinating disease. By three months the majority of people have recovered their vision to 2040 or better. Unfortunately about a third of people will have double vision recur in the unaffected eye within approximately, within approximately a 10 year period and if you've had optic neuritis there is greater than a 90 percent lifetime risk that you're going to develop multiple sclerosis. Optic neuritis by itself, if you have MS, may not be a bad prognostic sign. It is a sensory event, and especially if you have good recovery. Uh, again, I mentioned this already, that a very severe uh, optic neuritis or bilateral could, could mean a different disease. Um, and in most cases, even though your vision may recover, there may be permanent irreversible vision loss that occurs uh, in terms of the nerve cell loss, even though you may, your vision may seem pretty good or you may read 2020 on the eye doctor's chart. So here's an example of a normal pairing optic nerve, and this would be a swollen optic nerve. One third of the time in people who, who come in with uh, 
uh, optic, optic neuritis, uh, and I have to say actually these, uh, uh, these issues uh, are, are uh, uh, reversed there. One, one third of the time patients will have swollen, uh, a swollen optic nerve that the eye doctor can see. Two thirds of the time, in fact, uh, the, um, the optic neuritis is not visual to the eye doctor. After optic nerve damage, we can see paleness develop in the optic nerve where we see at the arrow there's a, a, a uh, waxy yellow color that is developed. And that's an indication, even if your vision has recovered completely to quote unquote normal, that's an indication that permanent vision loss occurs. The typical event of optic neuritis kills, on average, 20% of the nerve cells in the optic nerve. Obviously, if you've had repeated attacks of optic neuritis, 20%, 20%, 20% can really add up to really some profound vision loss. Here's one of the ways we can measure uh, the impact of optic neuritis, uh, um, and it's called a visual evoked potential test. This schematic shows shifting checker, uh, the, the, the checkerboard is a pattern that will then shift back and forth, and then the patient uh, uh, views this shifting checkerboard images. There are little electrodes uh, uh, placed on, on the scalp, and those electrodes record the electrical activity, and from that electrical activity, we can determine um, if there is slowing in conduction of the optic nerve, which is the hallmark of optic neuritis. So here's an example. I uh, hope, hope none of you get seizures or migraines because that little diagram in the corner is a little, uh, can be a little irritating after a while. Uh, the, the top pattern shows a visual uh, evoked potential. And look at the, uh, uh, and the squiggly lines there, if you can look at that without the, 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 the uh, uh, shifting checkerboard there. Um, there's a difference between the normal and the abnormal in that peak that points down. And that is typically that delay in conduction is what that is showing. We have a, uh, and so latency is what we call that. We have a newer, um, more uh, specific uh, and much more sensitive test called a multifocal VEP, and that's that shifting pattern that you see. And I'm not going to move the slide because that was getting to me a little bit. Now, this is a study um, done qu uh, quite a while back that attempted uh, the, the um, colored circles on the bottom. Now, each, each of these MRI panels are separate patients. The colored panels on the bottom are their optical coherence tomography measurements. So the measurement of the densities of the nerve cells in the back of their eyes. The MRI images are images of brain atrophy. And as you can see, the black fluid filled spaces in the center of those images in each of those three patients increased, 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 showing each of those patients having more and more atrophy. The numbers along the bottom are the actual measurements of the thickness of the brain cell density in the back of the eye from OCT. And so we've known uh, that OCT correlates with um, uh, brain atrophy. And in fact, uh, I use OCT in my clinical practice to identify someone when they're losing nerve cells faster than aging. I can often detect that on an OCT before we can see it on an MRI. Early warning is always good. This is one of the things I do with most of my patients. Now here's another tool that we use regularly um, uh, called contrast sensitivity at the top, the top panel on the right. Uh, this is a little different type of eye chart than what you might see at your eye doctor. This is called a Sloan low contrast acuity chart. And uh, essentially the black letters on the white background would be equivalent to the, the um, visual assessments that you do when you go to your eye doctor. However, that's not what most people with MS have problems with. It is this chart on the bottom where persons with MS follow, whether they've had optic neuritis or not, many people with MS um, have damage in their optic nerve and their contrast sensitivity is impaired. So if you have MS and you've never had optic neuritis, but your vision doesn't seem quite right, especially if it's flat lighting conditions, gray overcast days, uh, um, might be something going on in your optic nerves. Again, lots of other reasons uh, uh, for that could be present, such as uh, dry eye, uh, cataracts, things that we've talked about before. So this is not only a research tool, but this is something that, that could be used by neurologists uh, in their office to monitor patients with MS for change over time that might be very important. This just gives a general sense of the relative sensitivity. It's much more sensitive than ultrasound, and, and our most sensitive uh, diagnostic scanning technique, confocal microscopy, uh, um, is more sensitive than OCT, but OCT is very, very sensitive. We can measure down to microns of thickness in the back of the eye. 
Here's what a typical OCT printout might look like. And you can see the colored images uh, in, in the squares on the top. And you can see differences. Uh, the dark uh, circles uh, in, in, the, uh, in the center um, on the top panels are optic nerve. And the red colors coming out of that show the density of the nerve fiber layer. And you can see in the panels, right eye compared to left eye, OS being the left, OD being the right. Um, and, and typically in the world of, of, of ophthalmology, uh, everything's backwards, right? We say uh, the right eye, uh, we always present on, on the opposite side. So in this case, we see there's thinning of the nerve layer in the optic nerve in the patient's left eye on this image. And then the image on the bottom is imaging of the macula, what I mentioned before, those nerve cells and the ganglion cells, the nerve cell bodies that exist in the macula. And you can see a difference in the density, uh, uh, again, between the right and the left eye in these maps below. This is something called perimetry or visual fields. You may have had one of these done in the office and you can see uh, in your ophthalmologist's office is something that we monitor with our patients in the neurovisual diagnostic lab. Um, and we can see these uh, differences. So this would be a, an example of serial changes over time in somebody with MS uh, where they are gradually losing nerve cells. Um, perhaps uh, uh, the panel on the right could show an opt uh, the sudden change over time could show an optic neuritis. Typically this is what we do to measure the, the impact of the damage. Now, uh, many people with optic neuritis will recover their visual field loss. And again, the typical, most common things that are left over, even if people recover completely to normal, is subtle contrast sensitivity and maybe color vision problems. So um, vision's represented differently in the back of the eye. And uh, like everything else with our bodies, everything on the left winds up on the right side of our brain. Everything on the right winds up on the left side of our brain. This panel on the, on the lower left shows us uh, just how that vision is, is divided and those pathways split at what's called the optic chiasm. The panel on the right attempts to show a pathway called the MLF. This pathway is a, is a very slender pathway of nerves in the brainstem that keeps the eye movements yoked together. So horizontal control of my eye movements, um, the thought originates here to look to the left in the right prefrontal cortex. And then the nerves go down to the brainstem, and we see this pathway of input that's blocked. The little X blocks the pathway of the MLF. Well, when those nerve fibers tell the brainstem to stimulate the eyes to look to the left, both eyes have to go at the same time exactly. The yoking of those eye movements are, occur through that pathway called the MLF. And that pathway is commonly damaged in people with MS. This will cause a problem, as you see in the cartoon, where one eye goes this way and the other eye doesn't. Um, in fact, sometimes you will even see something where there's some coarse beats of nystagmus when the patient attempts to look to uh, one side or the other. Uh, if a young person develops an intranuclear ophthalmoplegia, it is almost always MS. Older people may be prone to develop vascular disease, so uh, strokes and various vascular issues can occur in people who are older. So, uh, but this is something that's very, very common in MS and, and should increase the concern for MS if, if someone's diagnosed with an intranuclear ophthalmoplegia is what it's called. There are other issues that can, that, um, that can occur as well. Um, nystagmus is kind of hard to describe. I can wave my arms around and do a few things like that, but you're better with videos. So there are some links to some, some videos of, of various uh, uh, ocular uh, issues. Um, and um, nystagmus, of course, is difficult to treat. Nystagmus generally in MS occurs because of damage in the brainstem or cerebellum. Uh, and it, is, it can be very localizing. Nystagmus can be horizontal, it can be vertical, um, it can be rotary, uh, it can be even be different in the two eyes. Uh, in MS, because the, brains, the damage in the brainstem is really diffuse, we can see all sorts of ocular motility issues develop, um, including different patterns of nystagmus that sometimes don't really follow the rules. They don't stick to certain types. You can have rotary and um, uh, jerk nystagmus vertical or horizontal in the same patient at the same time. So, NMO, 
This is a condition that is not MS but looks very much like MS and we in fact used to lump it into as a type of MS that we called um, uh, Devic's disease. So now we call it neuromyelitis myelitis optica because we've identified it as different immunologically. There are antibodies that are elaborated. It is very rare compared to MS. The aquaforin 4 antibody can be tested in the blood, but it's not always positive in people who do have NMO. Optic neuritis is often the presenting feature of NMO, and if you've just had optic neuritis, it may look pretty much like MS. However, it tends to be much more severe with incomplete recovery, and often it will present with bilateral loss of vision at the same time. So bilateral optic neuritis or optic neuritis that attacks the optic chiasm is, is uh, much more likely to be uh, a, neuro, uh, a neuromyelitis optica. Transverse myelitis is damage in the spinal cord. This disease causes large segment damage or long segment damage uh, uh, lesions in the spinal cord and can lead to paralysis. And again, the recovery is often incomplete. Interestingly, uh, this condition can also lead to intractable nausea and vomiting. Brain lesions may not look like MS exactly, but they can be close enough to be confused for multiple sclerosis. I'm going to show you some data quickly because we mentioned contrast sensitivity. Here's, here's a, uh, a treatment trial uh, from a study on natalizumab uh, or Tysabri. And in these two studies, we see the two lines basically showing that the patients who were not treated versus the patients who were treated in terms of the dotted line were the patients who were treated. And over time, the patients who were treated with natalizumab, natalizumab had less vision loss. We see a similar uh, uh, from a research study on alentuzumab um, where we actually saw improvements in contrast sensitivity over the course of treatment that were quite prolonged over time. Um, uh, we've also seen uh, studies that have shown improvement. This was a natalizumab study that actually showed improvement in the visual evoked potential of uh, the shifting checkerboards that I showed you previously. We mentioned cataracts, already talked about this as far as the impact of corticosteroids and the need for you to get regular eye examinations. There might be some things that we can do in terms of sending you to a low vision clinic if you have a lot of damage in your optic nerve. You see in the middle some tinted glasses, yellow tinted glasses uh, can improve that contrast vision loss. They're not just for skiers and in fact I ask my patients to, to keep a pair of these in their car in case they ever need them. Just a few vision tips as far as uh, things that we might do. Uh, separate glasses often may be helpful. Tents and various other things can help improve that as well. And I will uh, leave you to read those on your own. And I now will yield to Dr. Cantor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Dr. Cantor, and Dr. Cantor is President Emeritus of the Florida Society of Neurology and the founding president of the Medical Partnership for MS, and is an active member of the Healthcare Advisory Committees of the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation, the Multiple Sclerosis Association of America, and MS Views and News. Thank you, Dr. Cantor. Chief Medical Correspondent of MS World and is the co-scientific director of the largest U.S.-based MS patient registry called Corona MS. He is the past chair of the Florida Medicaid Pharmacy and Therapeutics Committee, past director of the Co Comprehensive MS Center at the University of Florida in Jacksonville, inaugural Neurology Residency Program Director at the Schmidt College of Medicine, Florida Atlantic University, and past chair of education and board member of the Southern Headache Society. Dr. Kanner is board certified in both neurology and headache medicine. Let's, let's now, let's, yeah, let's now welcome Dr. Cantor. Thank you. Today what we're going to talk about is how to use the resources that you have already inside you in order to get the best care possible. What we're going to do is we're going to look at communication and talk about ways of making that communication even better.
We're going to talk about proactive management of your multiple sclerosis. We're going to remind you that organizational concepts are important. This means taking an active role in your health care, and this also means that you have to make informed choices, and the way you're going to make those informed choices is by making sure to record things that happen to you, to record symptoms that may occur, and to try to do this in order to make your life better. We're going to conclude with talking about headaches. In 1903, Sir William Osler said, the best teaching is that done by the patient himself. And no matter what your doctors talk to you about, fancy testing, MRIs, newer technology, what we know is true today just like it was true in 1903. And that is what you know about yourself is more important than almost anything else that your doctors can tell you. And that's why we came up with this idea called MSTAR. The idea of the multiple sclerosis team approach rule is that really the person with MS is the center of that team. On the one side of that team, you're going to have people like the doctors, you're going to have the primary care physician, you're going to have the neurologist, whether that means a neurologist, an MD or DO, or whether that means a nurse practitioner or physician assistant. It means you're going to have the physical therapist, the occupational therapist, the speech therapist, the case managers, all of us who are there to support you. But remember that you yourself are the most important person in that team. And then on the other side, you're going to have the people that are very important to you. You're going to have that significant other. You're going to have that care partner. You're going to have family. You're going to have your community. In many parts of this country, that also means your religious community. You're going to have your job, whether that means retaining your job or whether that means that it's time to apply for disability. It means that your job is going to be an important part of this team. And then there's the MS community. The MS community is a rich community made up of nonprofits, large and small, that are all there to support you. But everyone's needs are different. While some people may have problems with fatigue, other people may have problems with concentration, other people may have problems with movement, other people may have problems with their walking, other people with their sensation. What's going on with you is going to be different than what's going on with other people around you. And so that's why it's so important that you build your team. And when you build your team, you want to tailor that team to your needs. That means you want to have open lines of communication. And that means that you may need to make trades when needed. When you're trying to do that communication, remember that there is an ugly word that can enter into those lines of communication. And that ugly word is jargon. Jargon is a fancy word, meaning fancy words. Jargon doesn't have any place in that communication with your healthcare team, either coming from them or coming from you. That means that don't tell your doctor, for example, that you have a neuropathy going on. When you say that you think you're trying to be helpful, you're trying to describe to your healthcare team that you have nerve, like your nerve, pathy, pathological, you're probably trying to say that you have pain going on. But your doctor may hear neuropathy and may start to think about peripheral neuropathy. And then because they're thinking about peripheral neuropathy, they're going to think about diabetes, diabetes, diabetes. Meanwhile, you don't even have diabetes. This is taken away from your care. And so what you want to make sure that you always do is you want to make sure that you take jargon away. Don't let your doctors use fancy words and don't you try to use fancy words. Use everyday language to describe what's going on with you. Now, how do people perceive their MS? Most people, it turns out, may have MS and not even know it. But when people do have MS and know it, when it means they've been already diagnosed, then a minority will feel completely fine. But many people will feel things such as head fogginess. People will feel problems with concentration difficulties. They'll feel mysterious kinds of pains. They may feel clumsy, and they may feel limitations in terms of their gait, their walking, in terms of their bladder, in terms of their energy. And as you can imagine, for everyone, those symptoms are going to be different. But how do your neurologists perceive MS? Oftentimes, neurologists may see MS and perceive it in a completely different way than you do. They may find it troubling to diagnose. They may say that it requires more time than almost any other diagnosis that they're used to taking care of. 
They may wish that someone else could do it. They may say, well, I can't make these people with MS happy. I don't have all the tools that I want to have in order to make it. And that may make your neurologist even feel burnt out as well. It may feel that it takes too long to talk to people with MS. They may think that it costs them a lot of money to try to get approvals for different types of treatments and to try to get you with your optimized health care. When you're thinking about your healthcare team and you're thinking about you and your family, what you want to think about is that you and your family need to organize yourself before your office visit. Your office visits are going to be small pieces of time when you go in to see either your primary care or your neurologist or other sorts of healthcare providers. And so what you want to do is you want to come organized beforehand. But you also want to stick with the program that you agree with. If you don't agree with the program, let your doctors know at the time. Don't wait till afterwards to say, oh, well, I don't agree with what's going on. Because then you have to wait till the next office visit. Make sure to see your neurologist regularly. Make sure that you are immunized. What we're learning is that immunizations are very important to try to prevent illnesses from happening and so you want to make sure that you and the, your family members around you want to make sure that you do that safely. So talk to your doctors about that. Keep lists. Don't try to remember everything on your own. Make sure to keep lists of your medications, keep list of your symptoms, keep list of when problems happen, keep list of what happened during your doctor's visits. Nowadays that's become a lot easier than simply using a pen and paper. Nowadays many people have mobile devices, many people have other ways to keep those things organized. But what you want to remember is when you do keep those lists and you want to share them with someone, make sure to have them printed out. You can't bring a list and expect your doctor to be able to scan your screen of your phone. It becomes almost impossible to do so. And as we found out recently, the government itself can't even break, down, break into your phone when something happens. So when the password is protected and you're unable to open it, it becomes a problem. So make sure to have typed out lists as well. When you're thinking about your healthcare team and you're thinking about your primary care, you're thinking about family medicine. If you're a woman, you may be thinking about your obstetrician or gynecologist. You may be thinking about your family medicine doctor as well. You want to try to avoid quacks, try to avoid miracle cures, try to avoid just supplements, and think about making sure that all your comorbidities, when we say comorbidities, what we mean are things aside from MS that you may have else going on with you. You want to make sure that those comorbidities like high blood pressure, like diabetes, you want to make sure that all of those are taken care of. You want to ask your primary care physician if they can handle the minor illnesses that may happen. If you have bladder problems or you have sinus problems, you want to make sure your blood pressure remains under good control. Your blood sugar or blood glucose remains under control. You want to make sure your cholesterol, you want to make sure your weight. You want to help with, start, with stopping smoke. You want to make sure that you don't have smoking as part of the problems that you're doing. You want your primary care physician to help you with screening tests. You want to make sure to avoid different kinds of cancers that can happen, whether you have multiple sclerosis or not, and you want to make sure that you're able to do that. When you're thinking about your healthcare team, you also want to think about what your neurologist is going to be doing. Your neurologist is going to be talking to you about medications, and only very rare exceptions are they going to say that you don't need medications. You want to get another neurologist if you feel like you're not communicating with each other, if you feel like you're not given explanations, if you are told that you don't need treatment and you're not given a reason why, if you're told to stop treatment and you're not given a reason why, if you are told that your MS is simply benign and they say that they can tell that from the beginning. Oftentimes when people talk about this concept of benign MS, it's a diagnosis that can only be made later on. If you're told by a neurologist that you don't need to come in unless you're, having pro unless you're having problems or unless you're sick, well then these are things that you might want to talk to your doctor about, whether they're giving you the optimal care that you need. If your doctor doesn't look at your MRI, if your doctor doesn't want to examine you, doesn't want to take care of the things that are around you, if they don't want to track the symptoms or the relapses that are happening with you, then these are times that you may want to talk to your neurologist about whether you're getting that best kind of care that you can possibly get. So in order to get good care, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to make sure that you get your data together. 
You're going to want to follow through with the plan. If you have problems with the plan, these are things you're going to want to talk about beforehand. You're going to want to have regular neurology visits. You're not going to want to just come back if you're having problems. Your MRI should be done under internationally agreed upon consensus. We have ways of doing MRIs that we think can be more standardized. They involve standardized position. They involve not having skips, not just looking at certain parts of the brain and central nervous system and other parts. We use what we call thin slices. We want to make sure that we look at different aspects of your brain and spinal cord. Oftentimes, we're going to want to give gadolinium. We're going to want to give what people will call contrast to be able to see if there's problems or not. Your MRI should be read by a neuroradiologist or a radiologist trained in reading MRIs of the brain and spinal cord or by a very experienced neurologist. And you're going to want to have comparisons. You're going to want to be able to compare one MRI to other MRIs that you've had in the past. When you're thinking about do's and don'ts, well, some of the things you want to think about making sure that you do is you want to make sure that you have a history of your medical conditions as well as of your medicines. You want to have a history of your symptoms and other problems that you may have had. You want to have the dates and you want to have the types of relapses and where, how were they treated and when and where. If you have a problem with work or if you had to skip out on work or if you have to cut down on work or if you're not working, these are things that you're going to want to keep a good record of. If you have an eye problem, you're going to want to know what happened beforehand and what happened afterwards. And so what you're going to want to make sure is if you do have an eye problem where you need glasses, get those, that vision corrected beforehand before you even go in to see the neurologist and bring your glasses because they're going to want to test your eyes. And if you're not seeing well because you need glasses, it's going to make things even more confusing. You're going to want to bring your forms with you. If there are forms you need to fill out, either for the doctor's office or for your insurance or for the government, these are things you're going to want to make sure to bring with you. But then there are certain things you don't want to do. You don't want to make demands. You don't want to go in and just demand pain medicines or go in and demand medicines to make you have more energy. You want to have a dialogue. You want to be able to talk to your healthcare team, especially to your neurologist, in a way that's beneficial to both of you. What you want to do is you don't want to just substitute your neurology for all your primary care. You don't want to say, well, I'm seeing a neurologist, so I don't need to get regular care. I don't need to get screening care for other types of conditions. Remember, although multiple sclerosis is a hand that's been dealt to a lot of people, it doesn't mean that it's protective of other things. There can still be other problems that can happen, diabetes, high blood pressure, other medical conditions. And so you don't want to forget about that when you go and just see your neurologist. Don't come to your neurologist's office without having your medications with you or a very good list of those medicines and where you take them and when you don't take them. Don't expect your doctor to be able to go and run around and, and pick up other people's MRIs. Those are things that you should be able to bring with you. You want to call up the MRI facility, make sure that they print out for you either the actual films or a CD with your MRIs on them so that you can have them. Don't try to get everything done at once. Try to focus on three main things that you think are important for you at today's office visit. What are the top most important things that you want to talk about? By doing that, you're going to make yourself have a better office visit. When you try to just handle everything at once, it becomes very, very difficult to do that. And finally, don't waste time just spending time criticizing what other people have done. Look towards the future. Look towards what you can do to give yourselves the best and most optimal care. The important stuff that you need to know is that your visit time is premium. You're not seeing your doctor every day. And so what you want to do is you want to prepare before that office visit. You want to be organized and prepared. And you may want to ask other people around you, those loved ones around you or your significant other or others, what they think you should talk about when you go to that office visit. Know exactly what your medications are. Know when you went to see a doctor and who you went to see. What was done. You want to make sure to have the records that are needed. This is all very important so that this office visit can go as smoothly as possible. And only by the office visit going as smoothly as possible are you able to get the best care that's there for you. You want to keep a record of the relapses you've had. You want to talk about what happened. You don't want to just say, well, I've had 20 relapses. You want to say, what happened during these attacks? 
What happened during these flares or exacerbations? What did you happen to you? What was the treatment that happened? If your blood pressure or sugar is out of control, those are things that you want to make sure that you get under better control and you want to make sure that you have more information about them. You want to ask your doctor to do an examination, to do even a standardized examination called an EDSS or Expanded Disability Status Scale score. If it's something that your doctor says they don't do, it may be something they don't know how to do. And so these are things that you want to clarify with your doctor. The idea of doing this is to make your office visit truly your office visit. And that means you want to get prepared. That means you want to come with a list of your questions and concerns. You want to bring a typed out list of your allergies and your medications. You want to remember that just like doctors oftentimes don't have good handwriting, your handwriting might not be perfect either. And so you want to keep that list typed out. That way you're able to change it over time. You want to bring your actual MRI CDs and not just the reports. You want to tell the office that you're going to, what the name and contact information is for your retail pharmacy, as well as for your specialty pharmacy where you may be getting your disease modifying therapies from. You want to know your authorization date. Oftentimes nowadays with insurance, you need to have your medications authorized. And that authorization may last for a year, but it may last for six months or it may last for other amounts of time. And so what you want to make sure to do is to know when that date is. And by knowing that, you know when to schedule your next office visit. And only by doing that are you able to make sure that you get your medications authorized on time and you don't have these sk skips or lapses in coverage. And if your pharmacist has a refill that they need, you want to make sure they send out those refill requests. It's good for you to clarify with your office visit at your office whether they want those requests by fax or whether they get them electronically or how it is that they want to receive them. You want to make sure before your office visit that your office has actually gotten the test that you had. And you want to make sure that everything's prepared so you don't show up and travel very far and find out that you're not getting the care that you deserve. You want to know your date. The date of your prior authorization is very, very important. And it's so important because if you have a date of your authorization, it's going to be six months down the line, but you're only seeing your neurologist now, your neurologist may not be able to fill out those forms or may not remember or recall as well when it gets closer to that time. You want to make sure to schedule an office visit around the time in a month before or, or two months before the next authorization of the medication so that your doctor can answer honestly and openly about how your care is going. How are you doing on that medicine in order to make sure that you can continue on it? Nowadays, although insurances seem like they cost a lot of money and your premiums have gone up and deductibles have gone up, many people actually feel that insurances are actually a bargain compared to the high price of multiple sclerosis, including the high price of the medications that we use to treat MS. And so you want to really be smart about your healthcare dollars. You want to think about if you are getting patient assistance, is this actually helping to defray some of your deductible and making it possible for you and your family to have other sorts of care with your insurance? If you're on especially some sort of governmental plan, so you're on a Medicare or a TRICARE, then you want to aggressively talk to the charities about the care. And you want to realize that many of those charities and foundations that give out medications or give out funding for medications run out of money at various times. And so you want to stay in contact with them to make sure that you get the most care possible. You need to realize also that the more medications that you've been on, it's actually easier the next medication that you go on because when you go through the step edits, as we call them, where insurance companies look at what you've been on, well, if you've been on other medicines, then it makes it easier for you to get on the next medicine. You want to recognize the rehabilitation services, so physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy. These aren't just like uh, membership clubs where you just go and and get the, the care that you need when you need it. These are also things that you need to upkeep and take care of on your own at home. You want to make sure to exercise regularly. You want to make sure to do those techniques that your physical or occupational therapist or other therapist has talked to you about in order to make yourself have the best care possible. <laughs>
Now, why should everyone care about headaches? Whether you have headaches or not, why should everyone care about it? Well, if you look at the population overall, not just people with MS, 47 to 99 percent of people overall in society have reported to have had headaches. And then when you look within that, 13 percent of people overall have what we call migraines. And so if you look at 100 people, what you're going to see is you're going to see about 12 of those people, 12, 13 of those people are going to actually have episodic migraine. And another two of those people, so another 2%, are going to have what we call chronic migraine. So they're going to have headache days that are more than 15 days a month. And when we're thinking about migraine, it's important to, to think about kind of this prototypical picture, this idea of a recurrent impairing type of headache that sometimes can be unilateral but doesn't always have to be unilateral. Sometimes can be throbbing but doesn't always have to be throbbing. So sometimes it's going to be on one side but sometimes it's going to be on both sides of the head. It's going to be associated either with nausea and or uh, vomiting and then or it's going to be associated with problems with light sensitivity and problems with sound sensitivity. So what we've done really well in the medical profession is take what should be concepts that are easy for people to understand and we've decided to make them into things that are harder to classify. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have here with International Classification of Headache Diseases, number three. And the idea is that we have all these different types of migraines. And we could go on and on about, about those different kinds of classifications, but when we look at the most common types of headaches and the most common types of migraines that people have, well then we could talk about migraines without aura, and those are oftentimes called the common migraine. And the idea of the common migraine is they're more common than the ones where people have a warning sign. And the idea is that people are going to oftentimes be on one side, so what we call unilateral, but not always. They're oftentimes going to be pulsating or throbbing, but not always. They're oftentimes going to be moderately or severely impairing, and they're going to stop you from doing things that you want to do, but not always. They're going to oftentimes be aggravated by activity, but not always. And then during those headaches, what you're going to have is you're going to either have, and some people have both of these, but you're going to either have nausea or vomiting, or you're going to have problems with light sensitivity and sound sensitivity. And we're going to have to make sure that there isn't another reason for what's going on. And so that's where this question of MS falls into place. It's unclear whether people with multiple sclerosis have more migraines than other people. If you look at some studies, it looks like, yes, people with MS have more migraines. Other studies look like, well, maybe it's just no different than what happens in the rest of the population. Yet other studies show that what we see with people with multiple sclerosis is they have a headache that's not exactly a true migraine. It has some features of it and may be a little bit different. What I find is that there are some people who have MS who have separately have multiple sclerosis, which is not a rare disorder. It's not very, very common, but it's not rare. And then other people, that same person, may also have what's very, very common. Like we said, 12, 13 percent of the population is going to have migraine. Then there are other people who have multiple sclerosis and as part of their MS, so a relapse or exacerbation, flare or attack of their MS, they may actually have things that sound like migraines. Oftentimes that can happen because when we think about migraines, we're thinking about this irritation that goes on in the meninges or the covering of the brain. And especially if you're going to have problems with your MS in the base of the brain and towards the top of the spinal cord called the periaqueductal gray matter. And that's just an area of the brain stem. That's also an area that can trigger migraines, but it's also an area that we can see dysfunction in multiple sclerosis. Sometimes there can be plaques or lesions of MS that can be very close to the covering or the meninges of the brain. And those can cause irritation that can cause those migraines as well. Yet other people with MS may be taking medications that can put them at greater risk or can make them predisposed to migraine, whereas they would not have had migraine as frequently if they hadn't had multiple sclerosis or hadn't been on those medications as well. 
The other common type of migraine is called migraine with aura. We also call those classical migraines, although they're not as common as, as people who have migraines without aura. And some people are going to have auras or warning signs before some of their migraines, and other times not. And those auras, while they can be sensory or motor, so there can be weird sensations or motor, or even problems with balance, or even problems in the eye, What's going to happen most commonly are going to be what we call visual auras. And people are going to see oftentimes things like, we call them scotomas or scintillations, where they can even see jagged edges and they can see those things expand. Oftentimes those are going to happen before the headache and they're going to happen for about you know, five to 60 minutes, oftentimes 15 to 20 minutes. And sometimes people will say, well, 30 minutes before I have a migraine, I have a warning sign that I'm going to have that migraine going on. And so this idea of, of visual problems or sometimes sensory or sometimes motor, but most commonly this visual problem that's going to give you a warning sign of the migraine is just something that your doctors are going to need to make sure that they differentiate and make sure that it's not an actual problem with your optic nerve, an actual problem with the nerve leading from the eyeball to the brain. And make sure that this is an actual problem that looks like it's coming from the migraine and not from something else. When we think about the different phases of migraine, oftentimes people focus on the headache. But remember, there can be things beforehand. There can be that aura, that warning beforehand, and there can even be a prodrome. And this can be a day or so where people feel kind of not nice and they feel yucky and they just feel ill before the headache is even going to come on. Sometimes people with migraines are going to have a post room where they just feel drained and they just don't feel like they have energy even the day after the migraine is going to happen. A question that people often ask is they say, well, do I just have sinus headache? Maybe I don't have migraine. Well, if you look at what happens during migraine, common symptoms of migraine are actually going to be things that we associate with our sinuses. Things like stuffiness, things like drainage that can happen, the weather association, these are going to be common symptoms of migraine as well. And in fact, most neurologists as well as ear, nose, and throat doctors don't actually feel that unless you have green pus coming out of your nose, you're actually having a sinus headache. What you're probably having is a migraine with that pressure behind the sinuses. And oftentimes people get scared when they have a stiff neck. They say, well, they heard beforehand that a stiff neck might mean that you have something called meningitis or that you have an infection going on that's affecting the covering of the brain. And in fact, we find that stiff neck is common not just during the headache phase, but even in the pre-drome phase before the headache, as well as the post-drome phase afterwards. And that's why it's so important when you're trying to do your headache care to not just try to do it on your own to bring a really good description and sit down with your neurologist and sit down and talk to them about what's going on with you to try to figure out what is happening because of migraine, what is happening because of other types of headache, what is happening because of multiple sclerosis. And although oftentimes we talk about multiple sclerosis as being the most common disabling neurological disease of the young that's not caused by trauma, many of us who take care of a lot of headache feel that migraine may be that. In fact, migraine is probably the fourth most common disabling condition for women and seventh most common disabling condition overall. It can cause a decrease in concentration and attention. There may be feelings of sadness or anxiety that can be around it. People can miss work. They can be less functioning than they would be otherwise. It can interfere with their job. It can interfere with their family functions as well. And in fact, sometimes I describe to people a condition that affects women more than men, young more than old, can be genetically predisposed. There can be an inflammatory soup on the meninges and the covering of the brain. And in a quarter of some series, there can be white spots on the brain. And in fact, I'm not describing multiple sclerosis, but I'm describing migraine. So aside from all those kinds of complicated ways that we've tried with international classification of headache disorders, there are some easier ways we can use to validate and to try to diagnose episodic migraine. And that's one of them is called pin the diagnosis. And by using this thing called ID migraine, we look whether someone has photophobia, sensitivity to light, whether the intensity is severe, whether they're going to have impairment or disability because of the headache, and whether they're going to have nausea. And if they have just two out of three of those, of nausea, problems with light, 
as well as impairment and disability, then they may be describing a migraine as well. Well, we spend a lot of time talking about migraine. There's other types of headache, and in fact, many people have a very common type of headache called a tension type of headache. And one way of thinking about attention type headache is attention type headaches are really the non migraines. All those things that we saw, the throbbing more commonly, and more commonly on one side, and more commonly more severe, and more commonly aggravated by physical activity, tension type headache is going to be the opposite. It's going to be more commonly going to be on both sides, more commonly going to be a pressing or a dull feeling rather than a throbbing or a pulsing feeling more commonly going to be mild or moderate, more commonly not going to be aggravated by activity. And so whether we're talking about headache or whether we're talking about other symptoms, what's important when we make our team is that this multiple sclerosis team approach really places you as the person with MS or the patient at the center of the team. But it's not just enough for each of us to have our own team. And it's important for all of us to look at these different principles, not just of patient care, which is what you go to your doctors for. Not just this idea of education, which today is an example of. And not just the idea of research. And research is very important because without research, we don't have our next therapies, our next ways of treating multiple sclerosis. But we need to look at the community overall. And that means the community, not just the people with multiple sclerosis, but that means the community even outside that of multiple sclerosis. And that's why we can envision each of these individual M stars helping each other. And by each of these individual M stars or multiple sclerosis team approach rules, not just focusing on themselves, but focusing on other people around them in their community, that is how we're going to create a multiple sclerosis patient network. We're going to have people with multiple sclerosis helping other people with multiple sclerosis. And the great news is that while in the 1950s we had a very little research and then in the 70s we started seeing a little more and then the 80s and then from the 90s onwards we've really seen a lot, we've now seen an asymptotic explosion in research. We're not just looking at disease-modifying therapies and every year we're seeing one to two new therapies come out. We're also looking at other ways. How can we use things like exercise to help with cognition with thinking and MS? How can we use diet to help? Not just diet alone, but how can we use it in supplement to be able to supplement what we're doing with people? We're looking at all these forms of research and what we're seeing is that there's more research than ever before. And that's why if we work together, people with multiple sclerosis, their families, care partners, as well as the neurologists and other doctors and healthcare providers working with them, if we all work together, then what we can do is make this multiple sclerosis team approach rule turn into a multiple sclerosis team approach reality. Thank you. Firstly, doctors, thank you. That was really awesome of all of you. All right, so it was very nice hearing each of your presentations and I'm I'm sure that the community will uh, think so as well. Uh, you each brought in some great topics, great conversations, and I wanted to thank you for that. I, as an MS patient, can appreciate it too. So I do thank you for all the things that I learned here today. All right, so our first question though, and I'm gonna start this one with Dr. Canner, and then we'll go to Dr. Hunter and, and Dr. Cockwood, and then we'll switch it around at other times. But you're each gonna answer, okay? But it's gonna see who comes out with the their answer first, all right, and then how creative you all can be afterwards with your additional like, answers. Is this like speed dating or something? Something like that. <laughs> something like that. Right. You have 60 seconds, by the way. 60 you seconds. have 60 so seconds. Good. And if you don't, then I have to go like that, you know? All right. all right. So the first question is going to be, what can you tell us about neurofilament light chain? The question was about neurofilament light chain. Let's go back to what we're actually talking about. What we're talking about is, uh, is there a biomarker that can help us with the diagnosis of MS, with the prognosis, meaning how you're doing in your MS, and also potentially a biomarker that's gonna help us in knowing how people are responding to different types of therapy. And, and so throughout time, we've seen different biomarkers come, different types of lab tests that people can do. The latest one that we've been hearing about in the last three years has been this idea of neurofilament light chain. And the idea is that it's showing a destruction or showing some damages that happen to the neurons 
And by seeing that, that's telling you something about the multiple sclerosis. The thing about neurofilament light chains is it's not just telling you about MS. In fact, what we've seen in recent studies is that as people age, their neurofilament light chains go up. If people also have things like diabetes, they're going to have higher neurofilament light chains. And so I think it's a little too early to know whether neurofilament light chain is going to end up being that lab test that's going to help us in the end or not. Great. Thank you for that. Dr. Hunter, your response. So it's a very interesting concept right now. The data, even with the best techniques and the best of hands, show it's really only useful for looking at groups of people who are under treatment because it's not precise enough. Um, it, we know we know it doesn't correlate just with having MS. That's fine. It's it's like well, you get it's like taking someone's temperature essentially. So you know they're sick because they have a fever. Uh, well, NFL football players have very high neurofilament light chain levels because they're getting their brain banged up all season and it goes down in the off season. Well, with MS, um, people who have very active disease have high levels. But the problem is it really takes a lot of it in going on to tell it's abnormal and we have other really sensitive ways examining people and doing MRI scans that actually are more proven and more reliable. Uh, could we get there someday where it's precise enough? Uh, maybe, but we're not there yet, and it's not gonna be real useful in the immediate future on a clinical basis. Great, Dr. Cockwood. Sure, um, that's a very interesting concept, I and mean, we've, we've looked for a while to try to find some marker of, of disease activity. Uh, you know, what we do now is we drive the bus of MS, uh, we're in charge of our patients' neurological health and their brain cells, and we're driving the bus of MS by looking in the rearview mirror all the time. So we, we decide if someone's treatment is efficacious enough based on are they having relapses, uh, are they having MRI changes, um, and, and is, there, is, is their disability uh, changing? Those are things that have already happened to my patient. I would really like to be able to identify a treatment failure before somebody has greater disability or has lost nerve cells due to this disease. So the notion of being able to measure a protein that should only belong inside of a nerve cell uh, that we can measure in the serum with a sensitive and relatively specific blood test could be really huge for us to be able to say, all right, measure this before we put you on treatment, see how it goes for a period of time, remeasure it, and are you responding to treatment? Well, hopefully we'll be able to use it that way someday, the comments of, of, of uh, Dr. Hunter and Dr. Cantor, I agree with. Um, I would, uh, just being the eye guy here, we just mentioned one thing presented at the Ectrams meeting. Correlative data now we have also with OCT showing that OCT in MS correlates with neurofilament light chain changes as well. So we're learning more and more about this potentially very important tool, but I agree, right now, not ready for prime time. Great. Thank you for all those answers. So how does one know if their medication is actually working? I'm going to start with you. All right. So it, people with MS uh, who get really good responses have a really easy time of telling this. And the problem is it sort of depends on how bad your MS and how disabled you are. Because if you're at a lower level of disability and you have a really good response, you feel like you don't have MS. Uh, some people who get home runs with more effective medicines, some of our very highly effective medicines that have a little more risk, produce really outstanding treatment responses. Uh, and people feel really good. But people with really severe MS that's rocking forward, even with a good treatment response, they still feel like they have MS and they may not feel well. And in fact, they often blame whatever they're feeling gets blamed on their medication. Sometimes it's responsible, sometimes it's not responsible. So it's quite a hard time for individuals to tell. And it's really, with neurologists, we're really quite systematic about it. And we are retrospective, as, as, as Dr. Cockwood was saying, because that is the best way to be able to sort of sort things out periodically. If things aren't changing quickly or they're stable, we consider that pretty good. We're not completely assured that it's without a problem. Dr. Cantor. 
Our medicines are studied almost always to look at reducing relapses or attacks or exacerbations, flares of multiple sclerosis. Increasingly, we're also looking at disability progression, and we're saying, well, is this confirmed after three months? Is it confirmed disability after six months? We're even using more novel ways of looking at, can we actually see disability improvement? But because most of our our studies are actually about relapses, the way we measure whether someone's doing well is if we're reducing those relapses. Now, if a person feels like their relapses are reduced, but other things are still not a problem, then that might tell them that their MS isn't doing as well as they would hope. The problem is we don't know if that next medicine is going to be helping them or not. Dr. Cockwood. Yeah, I think it's a very important thing being able to determine the effectiveness of a treatment and, and whether it's working or not. A, a person with MS can do this through several ways. Some of our treatments, again, our more highly efficacious treatments, will um, people actually even feel better. Um, but but you may be responding to your treatment and and feel the same. So um, again, we mentioned the three basic things: MRIs, relapses, disability. These are things we have been measuring forever about people. We study these in our research studies when we study new drugs. Um, it. It's the, while those things are important, uh, I think um, as we've learned more and more about this disease as being an always on disease and people are constantly losing brain cells, we want, and you've heard us all say measure, 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 we want to measure everything we can about our patients. Mm -hmm. Used to be we were happy to just slow this disease down. As we've gotten more highly efficacious tools where we can actually show neurological improvements in some cases and in some people, it, we, we've changed our target. Our target has now moved from slowing the disease down to no apparent disease activity, no evidence of disease activity is what we're going for. That requires that we measure people very carefully because they can't, people with MS may not be able to tell if they're responding to their treatment or by the time they can tell, they are, already have new or permanent neurological disability. Thank you. Thank you all, all of you for that. Uh, Dr. Cockwood, what is the future of remyelinating drugs or complementary treatments? Gosh, I, you know, if I could do that, tell them the future thing, I probably would. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, I, I can speculate. Uh, I, I can't know for sure, unfortunately. But um, the remyelination, uh, and I'll just take a step back to say we have for so long been focused on how we can impact the immune system, those critical steps where we can block the immune attack on the nervous system of persons with MS. Remyelination therapies opens up a whole new frontier, a frontier of restorative therapies where you can take somebody with a damaged nerve cell, at least right now where the nerve cell is damaged and injured, not working very well, we can remyelinate. We can encourage the brain tissues through, through mechanisms that are already there to remyelinate, protect, and support that nerve cell to make it work better. We are now entering an era where our research is focusing more and more on restorative therapies, things we can add to the treatments that block the immune response. Great. Thank you. Dr. Hunter. Well, um, I, I did my PhD in this field. Um, it, it was a reality to me. I could look at cells. I could look at animals. I could see it happen. I'm a little bit miffed that we don't have this working yet. Um, I think we've gotten better at controlling the disease. When we control the disease, repair happens. There's no question it happens. Uh, we can see it. We can measure it. What we don't know how is to enhance that repair in people who seem to be stalled and disabled. And every, there have been several good ideas which has come forward. I have some, by the way, if somebody has millions of dollars and they want to fund, fund, fund research and get the attention of a drug company, we can do it. I promise you. Uh, However, barring, barring that possibility, I have to work with the companies that do have the billions of dollars, and they are trying. They are trying. It is years away. It is at least five years away for four or five years for a drug that works, uh, probably longer. Probably. Dr. Cantor. It's not for a lack of trying. Uh, what we think about treating MS right now, we're thinking about mostly affecting the immune system. The idea of a remyelinating agent is going to be, well, we've talked for so long about demyelination, of loss of that myelin, of that white matter covering. Well, well how can we do to accelerate putting that back? The body itself does do that. The body can't do that when it's being attacked constantly. So the first thing is to stop the attack. But we're also going to need to add on to that this idea of remyelination.
So there have recently been some medications that have tried and failed in order to try to cause that remyelination. And so I think what we're going to see is we're going to see continued trials of those. And then one day we're going to see one that actually looks like it doesn't just work in the Petri dish, doesn't just work in the animal model, actually works in human beings as well. And that day could be in five years, but that day could be tomorrow that we start to see something that really does that. And that's why some people are actually looking at commonly used older generic medicines and saying what actually already makes the white matter, what makes the myelin regrow, what can we do to add to people in multiple sclerosis? So continuing on this same uh, set, this type of question, are these drugs though expected to cure and repair or, um, or are they just going to fix what's been damaged? The idea of many of these medicines to cause remyelination is to do actually two things. One is to form new myelin to form new white matter covering, which would make it better able to conduct electricity because you wouldn't have the short circuiting that you have as much in multiple sclerosis. Now, your, your body's still going to be attacking itself, and that's why alone they're not going to cure MS. But the idea is that with another medicine to try to stop the body from attacking itself, then what you're doing is you're really quashing down multiple sclerosis. The other thing is that myelin is like an external scaffolding. It's an external scaffolding that if you make it grow properly, then the nerves can grow back inside that myelin. Without that scaffolding, they can't do that. And so that's why there's a lot of hope that these medicines, these remyelinating agents, will actually be restorative for a lot of people. There, there's one we're watching that's uh, called ultra high dose biotin that will read out early next year and it's a very ambitious uh, high risk sort of trial but if it makes the brain work better it's going to be a revolution for people with lots of disability and progressive MS we really don't know what we're gonna see because the government standards for what represents a meaningful improvement are so high we think they may be beyond what is easily achievable by industry at this point and it's really un unfortunate because if you can't get a product to the point where it generates revenue you can't do more research with it and uh, the the huge amounts of investment you know over a billion dollars are used to build, bring a drug to market that's one of the reasons they're expensive it's certainly the reason it costs so much is it takes a very very long long time and a huge amount of manpower. Dr. Cochran. I mean, to the question, I would say my initial thought on remyelination, the actual process of remyelination and what that might mean for individuals would be an improvement in their existing function, in, in, in the, those nerves that are injured and damaged um, can improve. The, the biotin's a very interesting um, uh, uh, as well, because I, it, biotin seems to um, make, it, it's, while it's not a remyelinating agent, apparently it appears to work by um, uh, uh, helping along the chemical process, essentially the the, the swap of sodium and potassium in the nerve, make, making the nerve work more a damaged nerve work more efficiently. Um, so if we just limit the, the discussion to to remyelinating remyelinating agents, and that's why I sort of would lump things in and say restorative treatments in general. So we can remyelinate, we can make the existing nerve remyelinating by physically protecting that nerve better. We can make the existing nerve function better, um, and Ultimately, the holy grail where we're going to truly improve and restore lost function is when we can regenerate a nerve that has died. Because right now, they're the most precious cells on our body. You lose a nerve cell. They're also one of the most complex nerve cells in our body. So you lose a nerve cell, it's gone forever. Um, someday, I hope that's where we're going to arrive. Great, thank you. So let's take three questions from the audience, but they don't have microphones, so whatever they ask, we're gonna, whoever we're gonna start with first, which I'll make up my mind in 10 seconds, um, but just repeat the question, okay? So why don't you start first? You start with one question first. Um, what role do you each think uh, that the psychological plays in multiple schools? Let's start with Dr. Hunter. Well, psychology means uh, emotions and behavior, and it, it certainly is not only um, uh, 
part of how people respond to illness, but the illness affects it. And almost everybody with MS uh, at some point feels uh, depressed, and the majority will get a really major depression at some point. Some people, the other way, they get more bipolar type symptoms, anxiety, very common. So MS affects the frontal part of your brain, which is where you live. It's wh who you are is between, really like right behind your forehead and that is where our, our consciousness and our feelings and our drive and our emotions are are regulated and things in that area disrupted so so it's kind of hard to separate the two now do people actually cause their illness to be worse well there there's some evidence that by by having a negative view of the world you can affect your brain negatively there certainly is and, and it's not just limited to MS it's but one of the really extraordinary papers that came out about five, six years ago showed if you train people how to think about their disease, manage their fatigue, and how to have a positive outlook, it not only made them function better, it made their MRI scans better. So it really is an amazing machine that lies between our ears that we can affect it and it can affect us and, and we can program ourselves. Uh, I try to give people therapeutic thoughts, ways to think about their disease. I say things like, the pain is an indicator is not an indicator of how bad the problem is. It's just a pain that that you need to think about the long term. Dr. Shapiro, who who we all respect tremendously, used to say MS is a marathon, not a sprint. It's not the starters; it's the finishers. It. He still says it. He's not. Dead. He still says it. <laughs> hey, well, well, he is. He is a thought leader uh, from way back, and used to be the most important rehabilitation person. But I think that th these perspectives and the get up and go make yourself get up and go and make yourself think positively are really helpful dr Carquard. so so the question related to the 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 uh the psychology if you will of the individual with ms i think is a very important one we don't have a whole lot of data on this in ms but we do in other disease states um oncology uh, malignancies there is a slew of data showing that how somebody thinks has an impact on their outcome and um, I'm, uh, personally, I'm a pot calling the kettle black here in this, and, and it's very important to really focus on positives. Um, you know, this whole mind-brain link that we're looking for, I, I've always found it very interesting that the serotonin, this um, a neurotransmitter, very important for calming effects in the brain. We know serotonin reuptake inhibitors are very effective treating depression. Um, there are receptors on white blood cells, T cells, that attack the brains in MS. There are receptors for serotonin on those cells, yet we have very little information about what they actually do. But clearly there's some kind of interaction between the immune system and neurotransmitters in our brain. So I, I believe, I believe it, it's a hard thing to prove. In other disease states, we have better data than MS, but I, I do think it's important in how people think uh, a positive attitude, uh, I, I feel leads to a better outcome. Your outlook on life affects your MS a lot. And the thing that may tie your outlook as well as your MS may actually not be in your brain itself. It may be in the gut. We're learning more about how important the gut is in terms of the microbiome and in terms of other aspects. And just like Dr. Cockwood talked about this idea of serotonin, we see a lot of these serotonin receptors and serotonin inside the gut itself. And so it may not just be how we're feeling, it may also be what we're eating. And what we're eating, how we're feeling, how our MS is doing, all of those together may have a complex interaction. If you look at Pascal's theorem, this idea that, well, how do you know if God exists or not? Well, if God doesn't exist, then what's the big deal? You just wasted time following God's laws. But if God does exist and you didn't follow the laws, well, you really should have. <laughs> that, that, same, that same kind of idea falls into place here, where why not have a more positive attitude? Having a more positive attitude can only be beneficial. And so if it, there's a chance that it can help MS, we don't need a phase three clinical trial worth billions of dollars in order to be able to show something like that. It can be something that we can all do today. So in other words, it, 
it, it, it might not help, but it's not going to hurt. Right. <laughs> Great. Right. Who next had a question? You had a question? Um, yes. Um, I've been MS for many years, but how, explain to me how you know if you're, you're having a um, relapse versus you just live with it every day. And I mean, I'm, I'm talking from the, from the lay person, lay people that may be listening. Um, you know, you, you can have fatigue every day and whatever, but how, do, how would I know if I were home if I were having a relapse. Dr. Cantor, can you start with this one, but can you repeat her question? The question from a person who's had MS for a long time was how do you know if you're just having day-to-day -day symptoms or if you're having what we call a relapse, exacerbation, flare, or attack of multiple sclerosis? So the first thing I do is talk about what we mean by a relapse. What we mean by a relapse is generally that a person is doing basically the same in the past 30 days. So they're basically stable. And then a new or worsening of an older problem. It is harder when it's a worsening of an older problem. It's harder uh, for you to know what's going on. It's harder, frankly, for your neurologist to know what's going on. A newer problem is much easier for both you as well as your neurologist to be able to diagnose as a relapse. And then a new or worsening problem that looks like it's coming from the central nervous system, so from the brain, the optic nerves, the cervical, thoracic, spinal cord, is coming on, and it's lasting for longer than 24 hours. Usually it's a lot longer than just one day. And usually what's going to happen is it's going to come on gradually. Sometimes things may be sudden, but usually those things are going to come on gradually and go away gradually. And so oftentimes people will say, well, I don't know if I'm having a symptom of MS, if I'm having a relapse, an attack of MS, or if I'm having progression of disability. And one way to think about it is to think about time course and to say, well, am I having this problem Every day and it kind of comes and goes pretty fast. Well, that sounds more like a symptom of multiple sclerosis. Is it something where I'm basically doing okay and then it's coming on? Or is it something which over time just seems to continuously get worse? And that sounds more like progression of disability. Dr. Hunter. So I think that's always a great issue for people to ask. I would say if things are really minor, it's fine to watch them things that are clearly new or clearly suddenly getting in your way that weren't before usually relapses it's hard in the first few days to tell if you don't have an infection that's the cause for that most people with MS can't discriminate the feelings the feelings are no different in what's going on when they're getting an infection and coming down with an infection because the immune system turns on and their MS symptoms are worse we call it a pseudo relapse or a fake relapse relapse if it's associated with just with an infection but many times even after the infection the symptoms continue then we call it a relapse and rela uh, infections are the most common reason relapses occur the higher someone's level of disability is the harder it is to discriminate a minor relapse they're always disabled you know people who are lower they'll call uh, you know my hands tingling again and or my lips are tingling again and it's not it's not, first of all, a really major sign. It's usually minor. But we see them in the office to see because a lot of times they can't tell if they're not walking normally. They can't tell if there's some other symptom they have. Uh, they may not use their non-dominant hand, and they may not realize how clumsy it is. You know, And you see these things when you're examining someone. So neurologists can always provide perspective if there's a problem. But the urgency to the symptoms of handling a relapse aren't as great when they're minor symptoms symptoms. Um, they're notable. They ought to be seen. Um, emergencies are you can't see, you can't pee, or you can't walk. That really needs immediate care because something else also may be going on. People with MS, when they show up in an emergency department, get told that they have a stroke or a TIA. They almost never do. Now, if someone's older and you have something turn on like a switch, it's a major disability, you need to be seen in an emergency department and have an MRI scan right then. But it's still probably your MS. But MS patients get strokes, too, when they're older, just like everybody else can. Great. Thank you. And Dr. Cockwood. Yeah. So 
This is a challenge for the person, especially if they have some existing disability already. Um, clearly, you know something's going on, but then what's causing it? And the underlying issue is a pseudo relapse uh, versus a true relapse. A true relapse is going to be an inflammatory event in the nervous system. So you might notice if you're having a new relapse, true relapse, that you have brand new symptoms that you've never had before. I tell my patients to look for new symptoms that they've ne never had before um, or old symptoms that they have before that are either a lot more intense than they've ever been or maybe in a different part of their body than they've ever been before. And then very, very important is this 24 to 48 hour rule. I, uh, we tell our patients that if you have new symptoms, you don't have to be sure about what's causing them to call us. If you have new symptoms lasting longer than 24 to 48 hours, you should contact your neurologist. I think most MS doctors go by that basic creed. Uh, um, and we'll help you sort it out. Um, this can be a problem. You know, uh, Dr. Hunter mentioned a pseudo relapse means fake, fake relapse. So when my patients, when we diagnose a pseudo relapse in my patients, <laughs> I tell them, oh, so you're just trying to fake me out, right? You know, like you're faking? No. These are very, very real symptoms, and it's very difficult for an individual to know what the underlying cause is. So let us help you, like Dr. Hunter and Dr. Cantor. We monitor our patients carefully, um, and if there are changes, we can sometimes tell. I say sometimes because often people who had MS uh, longer also have other issues. We've said, I've said, people with MS are just people. They get the same things that everybody else gets. So knees, ankles, hips. Sometimes it's difficult to sort out what's causing those things, but that's what we're here for. So call us. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you all. So way off from the back of the room, we have a hand that keeps raising back there. So what is the protocol if, if you and the patient decide that it is a relapse? Do you brush them in for an MRI with gadolinium? That's a good question. So here, the question is, is what's the protocol if somebody thinks they have a significant relapse, do you rush them in for gadolinium? Uh, gadolinium being one of the parts of the MRI scan. Um, so it depends on the relapse and the situation. There are people where anything really new is very concerning. And the best example of this is NMO patients who don't to have MS. Uh, and the other is people who have MS on Tysabri. Tysabri has the unfortunate distinction of producing up to 5% life threatening complications in the brain, which are catastrophes if you don't detect them and treat them promptly. And they're often catastrophes despite that. Those people are treated very differently. But the average MS patient who's on treatment, who has a new problem that's neurological, has an MS relapse if they don't don't have an infection. How, what's the most common kind of infection that women have? A bladder infection. It's usually really obvious. Now the problem is some people have icky looking bladders all the time. You know, and and can they have a relapse? Sure, they can. Sometimes we just go ahead and treat their bladder, and we treat treat them as a relapse if we're not sure. But do you need an MRI scan generally when you have a relapse? The answer is no. You shouldn't get an MRI scan normally if you are if it's pretty clear you have a typical MS relapse. It delays your treatment. It de it can produce confusing symptoms if they can't get it done to appropriate standards. Then you may get some kind of med thing back in your medical record that says, "Oh, doesn't look like they have MS." <laughs> You know, or the MS isn't after, no acute change. It depends on who reads it. And some of the radiologists, they're very bad at MS. They're scary, bad at MS. And so doing things properly, you can get an MRI scan months later if you haven't had one in a while to assess how your disease is doing because you've had a relapse. Your doctor knows your disease has been active. He doesn't need an MRI scan in most cases. 75 or 80% of the time, you can't see what's causing the relapse anyway on the MRI. And that's normal. That is normal. That is not a mean you don't have a relapse. So why get an MRI scan in the middle of feeling bad and needing treatment? You get treated, and then a couple months later, if your doctor thinks you need an MRI scan when you've recovered, they can do one and see what the situation is. Good answer. Next one, Dr. Cockwood. So um, 
I, I think the way you proceed from from the point at which you've diagnosed someone or or you're you're comfortable saying that that individual is having a relapse again I agree with with uh, Dr. Hunter and Dr. Cantor that we want to rule out those things and make sure that you don't have an infection if we give you steroids to treat a relapse and you have an active infection that infection can get out of control so very very important that we do our best to eliminate uh, uh, some underlying cause or underlying underlying trigger um, as far as imaging I find it depends. Um, if I have someone where they're in the early stages of a new treatment where you've just initiated or transitioning a treatment and then and, and one treatment's going down in effectiveness and another one's increasing, um, I'm not going to do an MRI in that individual. If I have someone who presents with spinal cord syndrome though as, as a relapse, I may be concerned whether the disease modifying therapy is working or not. And even though I know the problems in the spinal cord, I may want to look at the brain because that's where the silent lesions tend to occur that might tip me off that their treatment isn't working well enough. So I, I, I can't just give you one answer for that because it so depends upon the clinical situation in front of you, where, where that person is in their course of MS, in their treatment of MS, what treatment they're on, how long they've been on it, all, all of these are factors. So I have in my brain this kind of matrix. So in general, I'm going to consider an MRI when there's been an acute relapse, I think is my answer. It doesn't necessarily make sense when a suspected relapse is happening to go ahead and to rush to an MRI. And the reason is Firstly, you have to think about what you're actually going to image. Oftentimes, the gut reaction where people will say, well, can I have an MRI of the brain? Even though if you examine the patient or hear the history, it sounds like the relapse is not happening from the brain, might be happening from the cervical spinal cord or the thoracic spinal cord. And I compare that to if you go and you, you break your, your arm and your doctor does an X-ray of your foot. It's just, it's a different part of the nervous system, so it's a different part of the, of the body, so it doesn't always make sense to do that. And then, even if it looks like that relapse might be happening from the brain and you're going ahead and getting the MRI of the brain, it may be that your MRI just doesn't show that relapse that is happening. And, and so, if you're, say, focused on the MRI instead of staying focused on the symptoms that are happening, then you're going to miss the boat. You're not going to be able to adequately address the problems you're having, and your doctor is not going to be able to adequately treat what's going on with you. Okay, going to change up this, uh, the way that we're doing things. We're gonna give you now 45 seconds, only mm -hmm. one of you to answer each of the next mm -hmm. set of questions, all right? Mm -hmm. Because we do have a lot of questions left. We have less time remaining than I expected. So let's do it this way. Let's start with Dr. Hunter. Um, one question for you, and each one of you will get separate questions, okay? All right, are there any objective tests that could predict a disease-modifying therapy? Which one will work for, per, per, for one particular person or another? Um, uh, MRI is widely held to be the best indicator of people who benefit from more aggressive uh, treatment. There are some uh, uh, studies that have been done that show that with Copaxone, you can predict who's a good predictor by doing some tests, which are unfortunately not covered by insurance, but basically classify how the immune system responds. And those are available. They're expensive, and it's a whole lot easier just to put people on Copaxone and see how they do. So, so but I, I would say MRI is the big discriminator. The other thing, vitamin D, your vitamin D level being less than 20 means you are in the worst half of people with MS. And if it's above 20, you're in the best half. And if it's above 50, you're in the best 10% of people who will perform with MS. Great. Thank you. Dr. Cantor, uh, can you tell us if MRI is a biomarker and if there's anything else that can be, con can be considered? When people think about the word biomarker, where they're thinking about something biologic that you can use to mark a disease. And for a lot of people, what they think about is they think in Star Trek with this idea that you can just run something and, and kind of know what's going on in the whole body. In the absence of that, a biomarker is supposed to be a cheap and easy test to tell you how someone's doing. The problem with MRIs are they're not cheap and they're not that easy. It takes time and a lot of people have claustrophobia. With that said, MRI is probably the best biomarker that we have uh, because it's not the actual person. It's a marker of how they're doing. It's, it's something showing you how they're doing. And so I would classify MRI as a biomarker. We have other things like OCT or optical coherence tomography. And then we have some lab testing. Right now, we've talked about
about serum neurofilament light chain, how that might be useful, and we have other blood tests that we're looking at as well. Okay. Dr. Corkwood, in 45 seconds, can you tell us, uh, can you see what kind of black holes are seen on MRI, and what do these black holes determine? You got 45 seconds. Are you going to say go, or? Okay. <laughs> so, um, so black holes on MRI scan. First of all, I hate the term, right? You know, the universe is not going to get sucked into your brain. I promise. So, so a, what a black hole really is is uh, an area, and what we really should call them are T1 hypo intensities. That's just descriptive. The T1 MRI scan uh, sequence is where black holes show up. That's where we see them. That's the image. That's the sequence we also do with contrast. So on the contrast image, a black hole will show up dark. Um, and inside of that dark area of the black hole, if that black hole's been there longer than six months, we call it a persistent black hole, and that means permanent neurological, permanent loss of brain tissue occurred in that area. The darker the hole, the more brain tissue died, essentially. Thank How you. How did I do? Was that 45 Very seconds? Very good. Very good. It's probably better than that. Dr. Hunter, what can you tell us about gadolinium contrast, how safe it is? All right, so there is a grave deal of concern that outweighs by thousands of fold in the magnitude uh, the, the real issues with gadolinium. So gadolinium, like many other metals in our body, is carefully handled by, it's corralled by an organic molecule when it's given to people. Gadolinium is not normally in our body. It is a rare earth metal. It is very large. I mean, it's similar to what we our body handles iron and copper and zinc, magnesium, magnesium. Manganese, all these metals have normal functions in our body. They're all tightly controlled. If you look at the brain of someone with MS, it's pa over packed with degenerated iron. All right, the iron's not good for your brain, but it's not doing that much harm either. Gadolinium has been looked at because a little bit of it from the older dyes sticks around in the brain, and we can see it on MRI. The MRI is very good at seeing it. That's why we use it as a contrast agent. The uh, uh, people with MS, the 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 dye leaks into the brain. We can see it very quickly, and a little bit of it doesn't come back out with the older dyes. For the last five or six years, we've had newer dyes that were developed specifically to deal with this. Now, if you have very poor kidney function, as in like you're on dialysis or about to be on dialysis, there's no question you should not get gadolinium because it will not leave your body because it leaves it through your kidneys and it's not safe to get and diseases have occurred rarely in people like that. There are very wide margins of safety established to make sure that doesn't happen. And only those people who have severe kidney dysfunction should not get gadolinium when they're looking for MRI. Now, do you need gadolinium? The problem is if you don't get it, you might have some active lesions that your doctor doesn't detect. And that alone is the most important thing to use it for because that failure alters by a factor of three to five the aggressiveness in a physician's caring for you. And being negative is good. And the gadolinium is not going to hurt you. It's been looked at. The government's looked at it. Scientists have looked at it. It's not doing any harm. We're trying to reduce that exposure because of children getting it. Um, and, and that's been very successful. And, and do you need it? If you have to have really, really frequent MRIs looking for PML on Tysabri, you probably don't need gadolinium for those but otherwise I think you need gadolinium that was good okay next one dr. Corkwood what suggestions do you have to get the most out of a doctor's visit everything dr. Cantor said <laughs> you told me I wasn't supposed to do that however you covered it very well in the previous slide presentation as far as preparing for a visit it's really important I think the key is uh, sometimes it's just overwhelming the amount of information we give you at a visit and I'll say we get the most phone calls from our patients in the week following their office visit is they're just kind of overwhelmed so a few things bring somebody along with you to help remember write it down if you want I work with scribes they can write things down for you too and reminders 
$100. We'll give it to you on a piece of paper, you'll lose. But then call us back and we'll tell you what it says. So um, it, it's, it's, it's important to be organized, know your medications. Don't come expecting that we got your labs that were done three months ago at an outside lab. Uh, uh, the, the things that Dr. Cantor mentioned, again, are very, very important. Um, so yes, being prepared and, and, and organized, I, I think, is, is one of the key. And, and come in with a clear set of questions in terms of saying, what's the most important thing for me to get out of this visit today? Because we have our agenda of taking care of your MS, but we also want to make sure that we're fulfilling your needs as well. Thank you. Dr. Kanner, what do you say to a, what can a patient say to a neurologist who seems to have um, like tunnel vision as one specific medication and they're not interested in hearing about any of the new meds that are out on the market that are, have been proven to, to be that much more effective than, than one of the older medications, one of the platform medications? I think it's important when you're talking to a neurologist to make sure to put everything on the table and to say, well, can you explain to me why you're talking about one medication versus another medication? Why is it that I fit more into the trial of one medicine versus another medication? If you can't reach a point where you come to agreement, where you're able to have that open and honest dialogue, then what might happen is it might be time for you to find another neurologist. Thank you. Um, Dr. Hunter, can you please tell us why people cannot give, why people with MS cannot give blood at a blood bank? It's complicated. Some cannot. Uh, the, the Many local policies will prevent them from doing that. It's changed off and on through the years, and that may be what the Red Cross says right now. In times, they've let them do it. Certain medications are more of an issue. If you're And this is probably if it's changed recently, and I'm not aware of what the changes are. Um, they're worried about you, if you have a medicine that circulates for a long period of time, exposing someone else to that medication. Now, you can give blood for yourself. You can probably give blood for a family member that where it's a known situation. Um, but it, it may be more related to medications than diagnosis and, and exposures. I mean, for a long time, they, if you went to Europe, they wouldn't let you donate blood because they were worried about mad cow disease after the HIV epidemic burned them so bad. But that was like, that was lawyers making those decisions, not scientists. Dr. Cantor, um, can a MS patient give uh, donate their organs. If a person with MS wants to donate their organs, then they should inform the organ donating place that they, they want to do that. Uh, sometimes those organ donating places will take them and sometimes they won't. And it will also depend on which organ. If you think about it, the risks of donating a heart, and a heart is a very valuable organ when you think about organ donation, uh, there's obviously some blood that's going to go along with it, but very little. And so many organ donating places will actually take a person with MS's organs as well. Great, thank you. Dr. Cockwood, uh, for the people that are having uh, a lot of pain with eye pain, what can they do for that? Eye pain's a particularly difficult thing. And I think what, uh, there's no blanket um, uh, blanket treatment. It depends on the underlying cause. So um, I, I think we see a few things that, that trigger eye pain in, in persons with MS. Uh, a, a chronic low-level eye pain can be called by uh, can be caused by something called iritis or uveitis, which is pretty common. You need to make sure it's really eye pain related to MS. Um, and and I find. The primary eye pain associated with acute optic neuritis would be able, but there'll be other symptoms associated. Treatment of eye pain really depends on the underlying problem. If it's, if it's inflammatory, like a uveitis or iritis, we can use eye drops. Uh, steroid eye drops can work. Uh, um, sometimes we'll have to use uh, oral medications. And then other times, uh, anti-inflammatories, if it's more of a migrainous related problem, lancinating eye pick, uh, 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 ice pick pains. And then we also have to distinguish from something called trigeminal neuralgia, which can be referred to the face and and sometimes appear in the eye. And each of those have a, a slightly different treatment. So the treatment comes from diagnosing what's causing the pain. Thank you. Dr. Hunter, what are the pros and cons to being a study guinea pig? Well, your nose starts twitching and you grow some unusual whiskers. But uh, the, the, um, let me tell you, every single thing we learn 
every advance in medicine, every new medicine, every new application in medicine comes because people volunteer for research. And in some cases, it works out badly. And in some cases, it works out unbelievably. And uh, nowadays, most of the research is done in, in established things where people are being treated between two medications. So it's not placebo controlled. Really new things and really early research is still done with with placebo controls or delays in treatment, something that lets us discriminate unequivocally the scientific value of a medication. Um, as far as the, the pros, um, first of all, it doesn't usually cost you anything except your time, and that actually gets compensated in many cases. We do research trial. People get, uh, the, we rent them a car, we rent them a hotel room if they need it. Uh, you know, they get a stipend for food. They get compensation for their time. They often get medicine, medicine for free. We often uh, give, they get concierge care for their MS because they're seeing us regularly. We get to work on all kinds of problems. Those are the, pr and plus they often get that for many years. If it's a medicine that works, it flips over and they keep getting the medicine because the company has invested a lot of money in understanding their MS. In some cases, we're able to look at their MRI scans so that we get free MRI scans for them. Um, and, and we're able to do a lot of things for them. I have people who get their contraception through us for clinical trials, who get, who get all kinds of, uh, we help their primary care refill some of their medicines. They're able to get uh, their, without extra paying, extra extra for appointments for their stimulants and, and their disability forms. Uh, so we're able to do a lot of things for people who volunteer their, uh, their uh, bodies for research while they're still alive. We say donate your brain to science while you're still alive. Thank you very much. There, there are very few cons. You have to come to the doctor on a schedule, usually when you're well. Thank okay. you very much. Dr. Kanner, is there a uh, MRI that can differentiate between migraine and multiple sclerosis? A lot of people with migraine actually do have white spots on the brain. Those white spots look sometimes a little bit different than MS, and sometimes they're in a little bit different locations, but oftentimes it can actually be confusing. And oftentimes a person with multiple sclerosis may also have this very, very common condition called migraine. Over 40 million Americans have migraine. And so what that means is some of the white spots that a person with MS has on their brain MRI may actually be from migraine, some of them may be from MS, and some of them may be from other things. So we don't yet have a great way of knowing for sure that this is a migraine white spot or an MS white spot. Dr. Cockwood, a uh, person wants to know what happens to them when it's like 90 plus degrees outside and, um, and they're out there for too long and they get this like uh, plastic sheeting look in their eye and what's happening? Hmm, good question. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, you can't be afraid to say you don't know, but uh, we would find out. Uh, I think I would ask that person a few more questions about the description of their visual symptom. Is it constant all the time? Does it vary? Does it come and go? Are there any associated symptoms? So it uh, becomes a more difficult question. My, my staff in the clinic always bring patient issues to me, and uh, they know they're going to present something, and I'm going to start asking them questions, because fine-tuning those details are, are, are kind of important. So he or the, she is saying that when they're out in that hot weather, that's when Mostly with heat. Happen. So if it's mostly just provoked by, by heat, I would suspect that that individual had a history of optic neuritis. I would look very carefully at that optic nerve, maybe look at the OCT, the nerve fiber layer, to help confirm that. Um, heat uh, does uh, affect the conduction velocity in the optic nerve. And um, that would be one thing, something called uh, uh, various, all neurologic, neurological symptoms can be, may be worse when someone gets overheated, stress, fatigue, et cetera. So that's what I would suspect is going on, that they have an old injury in the optic nerve and it's not a new event every time they're getting some uh, cobweb appearance when they get sort of overheated. Okay, great, thank you. And Dr. Uh, Hunter, can you tell us what's happening in the world of stem cell research? Well, we actually, 45 seconds, <laughs> 45 <Good> seconds. <laughs> you want to hear the auctioneer, here we seconds. go. So we've had two large clinical trials complete this year in, in what we call mesenchymal stem cell research, which is stem cells without getting chemotherapy. All right, we, we've had many trials with chemotherapy followed by stem cell rescue, which is called autologous hematopoietic stem cell. Does that work? Yes. Is it a good idea? No, because it's very unsafe. It's 
very dangerous. In fact, the better, if you want the ones that work better, you're taking a 5% risk on your life. And really, they're not going to take you unless you're early, not very disabled, and you have a whale of a bad case MS. Uh, so that said, the new research is regarding what people generally call just stem cells, which is taking people's blood cells, getting the ones that are generating the blood cells, growing them up in a laboratory, and readministering them to people. One large international multi-center trial was done with this with IV treatment on a regular basis. There was no important benefit. There was a very slight difference in MRI activity. It was not meaningful and it wouldn't have changed how we did it. We would have said any of our MS better medications, any of the MS medicines work better than that. There was another trial done based out of Israel uh, that was done both with IV and a separate trial in injecting into the spine these, these stem cells so that they get into the brain and they do get into the brain and it was randomly assigned so to make sure that there wasn't any selection. And there was no question that it was not very impressive on IV therapy. The injections into the spine were more impressive. Those are a lot more complicated to do, but and the benefits were actually worth studying further and will probably be studied further the clinic that has been doing it has been doing it for a long time and very few clinics do that kind of treatment when people call you up on the web and say they want you to come get stem cells everybody feels better it's a quack treatment don't do it there's good research going on but the, all of our ms medicines work better than what they've been demonstrating so far in research Okay, we only have time for three more questions, and I think that somebody from the audience wanted to ask another question. Yes, uh, Dr. Cockwood, you spoke about fluid leaks into the ocular nerve. Is that, does that have anything to do with contrast material? Would that also be leaking into the, if, if you had an MRI? Can you repeat the whole question? So the question was, um, I, I, I'd mentioned uh, uh, fluid leaking into the optic nerve, uh, and uh, I'm sorry, tell me the last part of the question was. Um, and so with contrast material, would the, is that also, I didn't know if, if you meant just regular cerebral spinal fluid or whatever is in there. What yeah. is leaking? Yeah, so I don't remember saying what was leaking uh, in, the, in the optic nerve. I think the blood vessels um, get leaky and that's what allows the contrast dye to um, leak out of the blood vessels into the brain, into the brain tissue. Um, we do see issues with uh, a fluid balance in the retina, um, and, and in some cases that can even be related to some of the MS treatments where, where uh, the S1P uh, class of therapies can um, impact the ability of the cells to adhere to each other so that they get a little leaky in the retina and we get something called cystoid macular edema. Uh, that can occur for other reasons as well. But um, So that's one issue in the retina. In the optic nerve, um, when there's acute inflammation, of course, there's fluid that leaks along with that inflammation, but then that recovers over time as the inflammation goes away. And the best thing to do, you can follow it by just tracking how fast the contrast dye uh, goes away is, is similar as well. Thank you for that. Dr. Cantor, um, could you please explain the difference between an optic migraine or an aura migraine or whatever other type is out there? You have 45 seconds. When people think about migraines, so these throbbing or pulsating headaches, oftentimes one-sided, uh, moderate to severe, and they can impair people and become worse with activity, many people think that they have to be preceded by something, by this aura, this warning sign, this idea that you're having the scintillation or you're seeing kind of jagged edges or you're seeing castle fortifications. While that is called classic migraine, that is not the more common type of migraine. The more common type of migraine does not have a warning sign. And in fact, in, in those migraines, people will just start having that throbbing headache without having the warning sign beforehand. Thank you. And Dr. Hunter, here comes the most difficult question of all, right? But since this is your party today, I want you to tell the world what you want the people with MS to know best. The, the most important thing about MS, get it diagnosed fast, get it treated from the first symptom, stay on treatment, don't stop, don't stop, don't stop. And if you're not doing well enough, then you need to look at other options. And there are lots of options for how to take 
it take therapy for MS. Well, thank you for that. But now I can't cut things off yet because that person that's way in the back of the crowd, she's <laughs> jumping up and down again and she has one more question to ask. There was some recent information published this week, I think, about Boston Children's Hospital. I'm wondering if you could each address that information for me. And I think something came out even a couple of days later out of Virginia. So if you don't know, all right, there was a study that was released by Boston Children's Hospital that shows that they have a way to reverse MS, all right, and it has something to do with targeting a rogue T cell uh, to prevent and reverse MS in those poor little mice. Okay. So uh, what we saw now recently with this report out of Boston Children's is something that we see pretty, sim we see pretty commonly. We see a new idea for how to treat MS, and it looks very exciting, and we'll find out over time whether it makes sense. This idea is to target one of the types of T cells, so these are the immune cells that are going to attack you in MS, and these are called T helper 17. For a long time, we used to talk about T helper 1 being the sort of bad ones in MS, and T helper 2 being the sort of good guys in MS, and then we found out there was a subset of the TH1 called TH17, and so what they're looking at is focusing on those very inflammatory T cells. And by doing that, could we be helping MS? It's very possible this would end up being a medication in the future. It's going to take a very long time. I would say, first of all, this is about treating mice with an experimental MS-like illness. And t these cells have been treated with other f kinds of strategies. They went after them with antibodies against a receptor that's unique to these TH17 T cells, which I would describe as the really bad players that cause serious inflammation in, in immune disease, therefore going after TB and other really nasty agents. And they produce a lot of recruitment of other cells. So are, is it an appropriate target? Yes. There are other drugs that have been tested that are in this family. Uh, actually, because it's a smaller market, they haven't been fully developed yet. Will things be more useful and go after? It, the concept is actually not a lot different than what we already do with Limtrata and Ocurbis. I, I would just, uh, first of all, I welcome any new discoveries. Um, a, a slide we saw uh, previously uh, from Dr. Cantor of this ramp up, this exponential increase in our research, but every new development starts out this way. And it starts out with a lot of excitement. And often people get the cart a little far in front of the horse. Um, so I think as we've seen, uh, and, and I think people with MS, unfortunately when we have a disease that doesn't have a highly effective treatments or, or, or where many people have issues, um, there's this sense um, that just one breakthrough, we just need one more breakthrough to get there and get to the cure. And, and there's a sort of rush to people say, oh, this is it, this is it. Well. Um, Welcome every new development, but put it in perspective. There's so much going on, but each piece of development adds more and more. So it's not additive, it's um, potentiating. So it's not three plus three, three developments, and three developments is six developments, it's three times three. And then it's nine times nine. So it's exponential. So yes, it's hopeful, yes, it's encouraging, but we need to understand it a lot more. But every step, we get closer. Gentlemen, thank you for all your answers here today. That was awesome, all right? Um, I know you're short on time. I know you have to get to the airport. Um, but uh, I want to thank Dr. Hunter for sponsoring today's event, and thank you very much. And, and thank you all for being here. And I'm, I'm hoping that the MS community gets something out of this, and uh, you'll find it soon on our YouTube channel for everybody to share with everybody else, okay? Thank you all again. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.